Chapter Twenty Two of the Mysteries of Paris, Volume One by Eugène Sue. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty Two, History of David and Cecily. Mister Willis, a rich American planter settled in Florida, said Murphy had discovered in one of his young black slaves named david who was employed in the infirmary attached to his dwelling a very remarkable degree of intelligence combined with a constant and deep commiseration for the sick poor to whom he gave with the utmost attention and care the medicine ordered by the doctors and moreover so strong a prepossession for the study of botany as applied to medicine that without any tuition he had composed and classified a sort of flora of the plants around the dwelling and the vicinity the establishment of mr willis situated on the borders of the sea was fifteen or twenty leagues from the nearest town and the medical men of the district ignorant as they were gave themselves no great deal of care or trouble in consequence at the long distance and the difficulty in procuring any means of conveyance desirous of remedying so extreme an inconvenience in a country subject to violent epidemics and to have at hand at all times a skilful practitioner the colonist made up his mind to send david to france to learn surgery and medicine enchanted at this offer the young black set out for paris and the planter paid all the expenses of his course of study david having for eight years studied with great diligence and remarkable effect received the degree of surgeon and physician with the most distinguished success and then returned to america to place himself and his skill under the direction of his master but david ought to have considered himself free and emancipated in fact and in law when he set foot in france david's loyalty is very rare he had promised mr willis to return and he did so he did not consider as his own the instruction which he had acquired with his master's money and besides he hoped to improve morally as well as physically the sufferings of the slaves his former companions he trusted to become not only their doctor but their firm friend and defender with the colonist he must indeed be imbued with the most unflinching probity and the most intense love for his fellow-creatures to return to a master an owner after having spent eight years in the midst of the society of the most democratic young men in europe judge of the man by this one trait well he returned to florida and truth to tell was used by mr willis with consideration and kindness eating at his table sleeping under his roof but this colonist was as stupid malevolent selfish and despotic as most creoles are and he thought himself very generous in giving david six hundred francs twenty-four livres a year salary at the end of some months a terrible typhus fever broke out in the plantation mr willis was attacked by it but soon restored through the careful attentions and efficacious remedies of david out of thirty negroes dangerously affected by this fatal disease only two perished mr willis much gratified by the services which david had so auspiciously rendered raised his wages to twelve hundred francs to the extreme gratification of the black doctor whose fellows regarded him as a divinity amongst them for he had with much difficulty it is true obtained from their master some few indulgences and was hoping to procure still more in the meanwhile he consoled these poor people and exhorted them to patience spake to them of god who watches over the black and the white man with an equal eye of another world not peopled with masters and slaves but with the just and the unjust of another life in eternity where man was no longer the beast of burden the property the thing of his fellow man but were the victims of this world so happy that they prayed in heaven for their tormentors what shall i tell you more to those unhappy wretches who contrary to other men count with bitter joy the hours which bring them nearer to the tomb to those unfortunate creatures who looked forward only to nothingness hereafter david breathed the language and the hope of a free and happy immortality and then their chains appeared less heavy and their toil less irksome he was their idol a year passed away in this manner amongst the handsomest of the female slaves of the house was a Métis about fifteen years of age named cecily and for this poor girl mr willis took a fancy for the first time in his life his advances were repulsed and obstinately resisted cecily was in love and with david who during the late fearful distemper had attended her with the most vigilant care afterwards a deep and mutual love repaid him the debt of gratitude 
David's taste was too refined to allow him to boast of his happiness before the time when he should marry Cecily, which was to be when she had turned her sixteenth year. Mr. Willis, ignorant of their love, had thrown his handkerchief right royally at the pretty Métisse, and she, in deep despair, sought David, and told him all the brutal attempts that she had been subjected to and with difficulty escaped. The black comforted her, and instantly went to Mr. Willis to request her hand in marriage. Diable, my dear Murphy, I can easily surmise the answer of the American sultan. He refused. He did. He said he had an inclination for the girl himself, that in his life before he had never experienced the repulse of a slave. He meant to possess her, and he would. David might choose another wife or mistress, which soever might best suit his inclination. There were in the plantation ten capuces, or metis, as pretty as Cecily. David talked of his love, love so long and tenderly shared, and the planter shrugged his shoulders. David urged, but it was all in vain. The Creole had the cool impudence to tell him that it was a bad example to see a master concede to a slave, and that he would not set that example to satisfy a caprice of David's. He entreated, supplicated, and his master lost his temper. David, blushing to humiliate himself further, spake in a firm tone of his services and disinterestedness. That he had been contented with a very slender salary. Mr. Willis was desperately enraged, and telling him he was a contumacious slave, threatened him with the chain. David replied with a few bitter and violent words. And two hours afterwards, bound to a stake, his skin was torn with the lash, whilst they bore Cecily to the harem of the planter in his sight. The conduct of the planter was brutal and horrible. It was adding absurdity to cruelty, for he must after that have required the man's services. Precisely so, for that very day the very fury into which he had worked himself, joined to the drunkenness in which the brood indulged every evening, brought on an inflammatory attack of the most dangerous description the symptoms of which appeared with the rapidity peculiar to such affectations. The planter was carried to his bed in a state of the highest fever. He sent off an express for a doctor, but he could not reach his abode in less than six-and-thirty hours. Really, this attack seems providential. The desperate condition of the man was quite deserved by him. The malady made fearful strides. David only could save the colonist. But Willis, distrustful, as all evildoers are, imagined that the black would revenge himself by administering poison. For, after having scourged him with a rod, he had thrown him into prison. At last, horrified at the progress of his illness, broken down by bodily anguish, and thinking that, as death also stared him in the face, he had one chance left in trusting to the generosity of his slave, after many distrusting doubts, Willis ordered David to be unchained. And David saved the planter. For five days and five nights he watched and tended him as if he had been his father, counteracting the disease, step by step with great skill and perfect knowledge, until at last he succeeded in defeating it, to the extreme surprise of the doctor who had been sent for, and who did not arrive until the second day. And when restored to health at last, the colonist— not desiring to blush before his own slave, whose presence constantly oppressed him with the recollection of his excessive nobleness of conduct, the colonist made an enormous sacrifice to attach the doctor he had sent for to his establishment, and David was again conducted to his dungeon. Horrible! But by no means astonishing! David must have been in the eyes of his brutal master a complete living remorse. Such conduct was dictated alike by revenge and jealousy. The blacks of Mr. Willis loved David with all the warmth of gratitude, for he had saved them body and soul. They knew the care he had bestowed on him when he lay tossing with fever between life and death, and, shaking off the deadening apathy which ordinarily besets slavery, these unfortunate creatures evinced their indignation, or rather grief, most powerfully when they saw David lacerated by the whip. Mr. Willis, deeply exasperated, affected to discover in this manifestation the appearance of revolt and, when he considered the influence which David had acquired over the slaves, he believed him capable of placing himself at the head of a rebellion to avenge himself of his wrongs. This fear was another motive with the colonists for using David in the most shameful manner, and entirely preventing him from effecting the malicious designs of which he suspected him. 
considering him as actuated by an irrepressible amount of terror, this conduct seems less stupid, but quite as ferocious. A short time after these events we arrived in America. Monseigneur had freighted a Danish brig at St. Thomas's, and we visited incognito all the settlements of the American coast along which we were sailing. We were most hospitably received by Mr. Willis, who the evening after our arrival, after he had been drinking, and as much from the excitement of wine as from a desire to boast, told us, in a horrid tone of brutal jesting, the history of David and Sicily. I forgot to say that, after having maltreated the girl, he had thrown her into a dungeon also, as a punishment for her disdain of him. His Royal Highness, on hearing Willis's fearful narration, thought the man was either drunk or a liar. But he was drunk. It was no lie. To remove any and all doubt, the colonist rose from the table, and desired a slave to bear a lantern and conduct us to David's cell. Well, what followed? In my life I never saw so distressing a spectacle. Pale, wan, meagre, half-naked, and covered with wounds, David and the unhappy girl, chained by the middle of the body, one at one end and the other at the other end of the dungeon, looked like spectres. The lantern that lighted us threw over this scene a still more ghastly hue. David did not utter a word when he saw us. His gaze was fixed and fearful. The colonist said to him with cruel irony, Well, doctor, how goes it? You, who are so clever, why don't you cure yourself? The black replied by a noble word and a dignified gesture. He raised his right hand slowly, his forefinger pointed to the roof, and without looking at the colonist, said in a solemn tone, God, and then was silent. God, replied the planter, bursting into a loud fit of laughter, tell him then, tell God to come and snatch you from my power, I defy him. Then Willis, overcome by fury and intoxication, shook his fist to heaven, and said in blasphemous language, Yes, I defy God to carry off my slaves before they are dead. The man was mad as well as brutal. We were utterly disgusted. Monseigneur did not say a word, and we left the cell. This dungeon was situated as well as the house on the seashore. We returned to our brig, which was moored a short distance off, and at one o'clock in the morning, when all the building were plunged in profound sleep, Monseigneur went on shore with eight men well armed, and going straight to the prison, burst open the doors and freed David and Sicily. The two victims were carried on board so quietly that they were not perceived. And then Monseigneur and I went to the planter's house. Strange contrast! These men torture their slaves, and yet do not take any precaution against them, but sleep with doors and windows open. We easily got access to the sleeping room of the planter, which was lighted on the inside by a small glass lamp. Monseigneur awakened the man, who sat upright in his bed, his brain still disturbed by the effect of his drunkenness. "'You have to-night defied God to carry off your two victims before their death, and he has taken them,' said Monseigneur. Then, taking a bag which I carried, and which contained twenty-five thousand francs in gold, he threw it on the fellow's bed and added, "'This will indemnify you for the loss of your two slaves. To your violence that destroys I oppose a violence that saves. God will judge between us.' We then retreated, leaving Mr. Willis stupefied, motionless, and believing himself under the influence of a dream. A few minutes later we were again on board the brig, which instantly set sail. It appears to me, my dear Murphy, that his royal highness overpaid this wretch for the loss of his slaves, for in fact David no longer belonged to him. We calculated as nearly as we could the expense which his studies had cost for eight years and then the price thrice over of himself and Cecilia's slaves. Our conduct was contrary to the rights of property, I know, but if you had seen in what a horrible state we found this unfortunate and half-dead couple, if you had heard the sacrilegious defiance almost cast in the face of the Almighty by this man, drunk with wine and ferocity, you would comprehend how Monseigneur desired, as he said, on this occasion to act as if it were in behalf of Providence." All this is as assailable and as justifiable as the punishment of the schoolmaster, my worthy squire. And had not this adventure any consequences? It could not. The brig was under Danish colours. The incognito of his royal highness was closely kept. We were taken for rich Englishmen. 
to whom could Willis have addressed his complaints if he had any to make? In fact, he had told us himself, and the medical man of Monseigneur declared it in a procès verbal, that the two slaves could not have lived eight days longer in this frightful dungeon. It required the greatest possible care to snatch David and Cecily from almost certain death. At last they were restored to life. From this period, David has been attached to the suite of Monseigneur as a medical man and is most devotedly attached to him. David married Cecily, of course, on arriving in Europe. This marriage, which ought to have been followed by results so happy, took place in the chapel of the palace of Monseigneur. But, by a most extraordinary vulsion of conduct, hardly was she in the full enjoyment of an unhoped-for position, when, forgetting all that David had suffered for her and what she had suffered for him, blushing in the new world to be wedded to a black, Cecily, seduced by a man of most depraved morals, committed her first fault. It would seem as though the natural perversity of this abandoned woman, having till then slumbered, was suddenly awakened, and developed itself with fearful energy. You know the rest, and all the scandal of the adventures that followed. After having been two years a wife, David, whose confidence in her was only equalled by his love, learned the full extent of her infamy. A thunderbolt aroused him from his blind security. They say he tried to kill his wife. Yes, but, through the interference of Monseigneur, he consented to allow her to be immured for life in a prison, and it is thence that Monseigneur now seeks to have her released. To your great astonishment as well as mine, my dear Baron. But it is growing late, and His Royal Highness is anxious that your courier should start for Gerolstein with as little delay as possible. In two hours' time he shall be on the road. So now, my dear Murphy, farewell till the evening. Till the evening, adieu. Have you, then, forgotten that there is a grand ball at the blank embassy, and that His Royal Highness will be present? True, I have always forgotten that, since the absence of Colonel Werner and the Count Darnheim, I have the honour to fulfil the functions of Chamberlain and aide-de-camp. Ah, a propos of the Count and the Colonel, when may we expect their return? Will they have soon completed their respective missions? You know that Monseigneur will keep them away as long as possible, that he may enjoy more solitude and liberty. As to the errand on which His Royal Highness has employed each of them, as an ostensible motive for getting rid of them in a quiet way, sending one to Avignon and the other to Strasbourg. I will tell you all about it some day, when we are both in a dull mood, for I will defy the most hypochondriacal person in existence not to burst with laughter at the narrative, as well as with certain passages in the dispatches of these worthy gentlemen, who have assumed their pretended missions with so serious an air. To tell the truth, I have never clearly understood why His Royal Highness attached the Colonel and the Count to his private person, why, my dear fellow, is not Colonel Werner the accurate type of military perfection? Is there, in the whole Germanic Confederation, a more elegant figure, more flourishing and splendid moustaches, and a more complete military figure? And when he is fully decorated, screwed in, uniformed, gold-laced, plumed, etc., etc., it is impossible to see a more glorious, self-satisfied, proud, handsome animal. True but it is his very good looks that prevent him from having the appearance of a man of refined and acute intellect. Well, and Monseigneur says that, thanks to the colonel, he is in the habit of finding even the dullest people in the world bearable. Before certain audiences which are of necessity, he shuts himself up with the colonel for a half hour or so, and then leaves him, full of spirits and light as air, quite ready to meet bores and defy them. Just as the Roman soldier who, before a forced march, used to sole his sandals with lead, and so found all fatigue light by leaving them off. I now discover the usefulness of the colonel. But the Count Darnheim? He is also very serviceable to our dear lord, for always hearing at his side the tinkling of his old cracked bell, shining and chattering, continually seeing this soap bubble so puffed up with nothingness, so magnificently variegated, and as such portraying the theatrical and puerile phase of sovereign power. His Royal Highness feels the more sensibly the vanity of those barren pomps and glories of the world, and, by contrast, has often derived the most serious and happy ideas from the contemplation of his useless and pattering Chamberlain. Well, well, but let us be just, my dear Murphy. Tell me, in what court in the world would you find a more perfect model of a Chamberlain? 
who knows better than dear old darnheim the numberless rules and strict observances of etiquette who bears with more becoming demeanour an enamelled cross around his neck or more majestically comports himself when the keys of office are suspended from his shoulders a propos baron monseigneur declares that the shoulders of a chamberlain have a peculiar physiognomy that is he says an appearance at once constrained and repulsive which it is painful to look at for alas and alack a day it is at the back of a chamberlain that the symbol of his office glitters and as monseigneur avers the worthy darnheim always seems tempted to present himself backwards that his importance may at once be seen felt and acknowledged the fact is that the incessant subject of the count's meditations is to ascertain by what fatal imagination and direction the chamberlain's key has been placed behind the chamberlain's back for it is related of him that he said with his accustomed good sense and with a kind of bitter grief what the devil one does not open a door with one's back at all events baron the courier the courier said murphy pointing to the clock sad old reprobate to make me chatter thus it is your fault present my respects to his royal highness said m de graun taking up his hat in haste and now adieu till the evening my dear murphy till the evening my dear baron fare thee well it will be late before we meet for i am sure that monseigneur will go this very day to pay a visit to the mysterious house in the rue du temple End of chapter 22 Chapter 23 of The Mysteries of Paris, Volume 1, by Eugène Sue. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 23 A House in the Rue du Temple, Part 1. In order to profit by the particulars furnished by Baron de Groen respecting La Goualeuse and Germain, the schoolmaster's son, it became necessary for Rodolphe to visit the house in the Rue du Temple, formerly the abode of that young man whose retreat the prince likewise hoped to discover through the intervention of mademoiselle rigolette although prepared to find it a difficult task inasmuch as it was more than probable if the grisette were really sufficiently in germain's confidence to be aware of his present abode she also knew too well his anxiety to conceal it to be likely to give the desired information by renting the chamber lately occupied by the young man rodolph besides being on the spot to follow up his researches considered he should also be enabled to observe closely the different individuals inhabiting the rest of the house the same day on which the conversation passed between the baron de groen and murphy rodolph plainly and unpretendingly dressed wended his way about three o'clock on a gloomy november afternoon towards the rue du temple situated in a district of much business and dense population the house in question had nothing remarkable in its appearance it was composed of a ground floor occupied by a man keeping a low sort of dram shop and four upper stories surmounted by attics a dark and narrow alley led to a small yard or rather a species of square well of about five or six feet in width completely destitute of either air or light and serving as a pestilential receptacle for all the filth thrown by the various occupants of the respective chambers from the unglazed sashes with which each landing-place was provided at the bottom of a damp dismal-looking staircase a glimmering light indicated the porter's residence rendered smoky and dingy by the constant burning of a lamp requisite even at midday to enlighten the gloomy hole into which rodolph entered for the purpose of asking leave to view the apartment then vacant a lamp placed behind a glass globe filled with water served as a reflector and by its light might be seen at the far end of the lodge as in courtesy it was styled a bed covered with a sort of patchwork counterpane exhibiting a mingled mass of every known colour and material a walnut tree table graced the side of the room bearing a variety of articles suited to the taste and ornamental notions of its owners first in order appeared a little waxen st john with a very fat lamb at his feet and a large peruke of flowing white curls on his head the whole enclosed in a cracked glass case the joinings of which were ingeniously secured by slips of blue paper secondly a pair of old plated candlesticks tarnished by time and bearing instead of lights two gilded oranges doubtless an offering to the portress on the last new year's day and thirdly two boxes the one composed of variegated straw the other covered with multitudinous shells but both smelling strongly of the galleys or house of correction note ten 
these boxes were the exclusive manufacture of the criminals confined either in the galleys or prisons, and who spent nearly all their spare hours in making them. Let us hope, for the sake of the morality of the portress in the Rue du Temple, that these precious specimens were not presented to her from the original owners and fabricators of them. And lastly, between the two boxes, and just beneath a circular clock, was suspended a pair of red Morocco dress boots, small enough for the feet of fairies, but elaborately and skilfully designed and completed. This chef dœuvre as the ancient masters of the craft would style them, joined to the fantastic designs sketched on the walls representing boots and shoes, abundantly indicated that the porter of this establishment devoted his time and his talents to the repairing of shoes and shoe leather. At the instant when Rodolphe ventured into the smoky den, M. Pipelet, the porter, temporarily absent, had left his better half, Madame Pipelet, as his representative. This individual was seated by the stove in the centre of the lodge, deeply engrossed in watching the boiling of a pot placed over it. The description of Madame Pipelet may be given in a few words. She was the most ugly, forbidding, wrinkled, toothless old hag one might meet in the course of a long life. Her dress was dirty, tawdry, and untidy, while her head-dress was composed of a brutus wig, originally of a blonde colour, but changed by time into every shade of red, brown, and yellow, the stiff ends of the perished hair standing out like ears of wheat in a wheat sheaf. Much did Madame Pipelet pride herself upon this tasteful covering to her sexagenarian skull, nor was it believed she ever laid it aside, whether sleeping or waking. At the sight of Rodolph, the porteress inquired in a surly tone, Well, and pray what do you want? I believe, madame, replied Rodolph, laying a profound emphasis on the word madame, I believe there is an apartment to be let in this house. The deep respect implied in his voice and words somewhat mollified the porteress, who answered rather less sourly. Yes, there is a room to let on the fourth floor, but you cannot see it now. Alfred has gone out. You are speaking of your son, I presume, madame. May I take the liberty of asking whether he is expected in shortly? I am not speaking of my son, but my husband. I suppose there is no act of parliament why my pipelet should not be called Alfred. Is there, pray? None, certainly, madame, that I am aware of. But with your kind permission, I will await his return. I am very desirous of taking the vacant chamber. Both the street and neighborhood suit me and the admirable order in which the house seems kept pleases me excessively. But previously to viewing the lodging I am anxious to take, I should be very glad to ascertain whether you, madame, could do me the favor to take the management of my little housekeeping off my hands. I never like to have any one about me but the authorized housekeeper belonging to the house, when such arrangements meet with their approbation. This proposition so flatteringly expressed, and the word housekeeper, completely won Madame Pipelet, who replied, "'With the greatest of pleasure, sir. I will attend to all you require. I am sure I shall be proud to wait upon such a gentleman. And for the small charge of six francs a month, you shall be treated like a prince. Then, for six francs a month, I may reckon upon your valuable services. Will you permit me to ask your name?' "'Pomona Fortunata Anastasia Pipelet.' "'Well, then, Madame Pipelet, Having agreed as to your own terms, will you be pleased to tell me those for the apartment I wish to engage? With the adjoining small closet, one hundred and fifty francs a month. Not a farthing less. The principal lessee is a screw, a regular skinflint. What is his name? Monsieur Bras Rouge. This name and the remembrances so unexpectedly presented by it made Rodolphe start. I think, Madame Pipelet, you were saying that the principal lessee of the house is Monsieur Bras Rouge. And he lives? Rue aux Fèves, number 13. He also keeps an estaminet near the Champs-Élysées. All doubt was then at an end. It was the Bras Rouge of infamous notoriety. And singular indeed did the circumstance of thus coming across him strike Rodolphe. But though M. Bras Rouge is your principal lessee, he is not, I presume, the owner of the house. May I ask who is? M. Bourdon, but I have never had communication with anyone besides M. Bras Rouge. With a design of still further ingratiating himself with the porteress, Rodolphe resumed. My dear madame, this cold day would make a little of something warm and comfortable very acceptable. 
might I venture to solicit the favour of your stepping as far as the spirit shop, kept so conveniently at hand, and bring a bottle of cassia and two glasses? For I feel very tired, and the cold has quite seized me. Stay, madame, we will have three glasses, if you please. Because I hope your husband will join us when he returns. So saying, he placed a franc in the fat, dirty hand of the portress. Ah, monsieur, you are determined to make us all fall in love with you cried madame pipelet nodding her approval of the commission and thereby sending the flush of pleasure into a face glowing with all the fiery honours of an excited bacchante to be sure there is nothing like a drop of really good cordial such a day as this and they do keep most excellent here at hand i'll go of course i will but i shall only bring a couple of glasses for alfred and i always drink out of the same glass poor old darling he is so very nice and particular in showing all those sort of delicate attentions to women. Then go along, my good Madame Pipelet, and we will wait until Alfred comes. But then, suppose anyone wants me whilst I am out, who will mind the lodge? Oh, I'll take care of the lodge. The old woman departed on her agreeable errand. At the termination of a few minutes, the postman tapped at the lodge window and putting his hand into the apartment, presented two letters merely saying three sous six sous you mean for two letters replied rodolph one is free answered the man having paid and dismissed the postman rodolph mechanically examined the two letters thus committed to his charge but at a further glance they seemed to him worthy a more attentive observation the epistle addressed to madame pipelet exhaled through its hot pressed envelope a strong odour of russia leather it bore on a seal of red wax the initials c r surmounted by a helmet and supported by a cross of the legion of honour the direction was written in a firm bold hand the heraldic device of the commingled cask and cross made rodolph smile and confirmed him in the idea that the writer of the letter in question was not a female who was this scented emblazoned correspondent of old anastasia pipelet rodolph felt an undefinable curiosity to know the other epistle written upon coarse and common paper was united only by a common wafer pricked over with the point of a pin and was addressed to m cesar bradamanti operating dentist evidently disguised the superscription was entirely composed of capital letters whether founded on a true or false presage this letter seemed to rodolph to wear a mournful look as though evil or misery were contained within its shabby folds he perceived that some of the letters in the direction were fainter than the others, and that the paper there seemed a little rumpled. A tear had evidently fallen upon it. Madame Pipelet returned, bearing the bottle of cassia and two glasses. "'I have dawdled, have I not, monsieur?' said she gaily. "'But let you once get into that good Père Saint-Joseph's shop, and it is hard work to get out again. Oh, that old man is very insinuating!' "'Here, madame,' interrupted Rodolph. Here are two letters the postman left while you were gone. Dear me, two letters? Pray excuse me, monsieur. I suppose you paid for them. I did. You are very good. I tell you what, then. We will settle that out of the first money you have to pay me. How much was it? Three sous, answered Rodolph, much amused at the ingenious method of reimbursement employed by Madame Pipelet. But may I, without offence, observe that one of the letters is addressed to you and that you possess in the writer a correspondent whose billets doux are marvellously well perfumed let us see what it is about said the porteress taking the epistle in the scented envelope yes upon my word it is scented up like a real billet doux now i should very much like to know who would dare write me a love letter he must be a villain and suppose it had fallen into your husband's hands madame pipelet Oh, for goodness sake, don't mention that, or I shall faint away in your arms. But how stupid I am! Now I know all about it, replied the fat porteress, shrugging her shoulders. To be sure, to be sure, it comes from the commandant. Lord bless me, what a fright I have had, for Alfred is as jealous as a Turk. Here is another letter addressed to Monsieur César Bradamanti. Ah, to be sure, the dentist on the third floor. I will put it in the letter boot. Rodolph fancied he had not caught the right words, but, to his astonishment, 
he saw Madame Pipelet gravely throw the letter alluded to into an old top boot hanging up against the wall. He looked at her with surprise. "'Do you mean,' said he at length, "'to put the gentleman's letter in?' "'Oh, yes, that is all right,' replied the portress. "'I have put it in the letter boot. "'There, you see. "'So now nobody's letters can be mislaid. "'And when the different lodgers return home, "'Alfred or myself turns the boot upside down. "'We sort them out, and everybody gets his own.' "'So saying, the portress proceeded to break the seal "'of the letter addressed to her, "'which, having done, she turned it round and round, "'looked at it in every direction.' Then, after a short appearance of embarrassment and uncertainty, she said to Rodolph, "'Alfred generally reads my letters for me, because I do not happen to be able to read them myself. Perhaps you would not mind just looking over this for me?' "'With the utmost pleasure,' quickly replied Rodolph, curious to dive into the mysteries of who Madame Pipelet's correspondent might be. And, forthwith, he read what follows, written upon hot-pressed paper, stamped in its right-hand corner with the helmet the letters c r the heraldic supporters and the cross of honour to-morrow friday about eleven o'clock let there be a good not an over fierce fire lighted in both rooms have everything well dusted and remove the coverings from the furniture taking especial care not to scratch the gilding or to soil or burn the carpet while lighting the fires if I should not be in about one o'clock, when a lady will arrive in a hackney-coach and inquire for me by the name of Monsieur Charles, let her be shown up to the apartment, after which the key is to be taken downstairs again, and kept till my arrival. Spite of the want of finished composition displayed in this billet, Rodolphe perfectly comprehended to whom and what it alluded to, and merely added after perusing it, Who lives on the first floor, then? The old woman placed her yellow, shriveled finger upon her pendulous lip, and replied by a half-malicious grin, "'Hush! There is a woman in the way. Silence!' "'Oh, my dear Madame Pipelet, I merely asked, because, before living in a house, one likes to know a little.' "'Yes, yes, of course, everybody likes to know all they can. That is all fair enough. And I am sure I have no objection to tell you all I know myself, but that is very little.' well but to begin about six weeks ago a carpet-maker came here to look at the first floor which was then to let and to ask the price and other particulars about it next day he came again accompanied by a young man of fair complexion small moustaches and wearing a cross of honour and very fine linen the carpet-maker called him commandant a military man i suppose said rodolph military exclaimed madame pipelet with a chuckle not he why alfred might as well call himself porter to a prince how so why he is only in the national guard the carpet-maker only called him commandant to flatter him just the same as it tickles up alfred's vanity to be styled concierge instead of porter so when the commandant that is the only name we know him by had looked over the rooms he said to the upholsterer his friend well i think the place will do for me just see the landlord and arrange all about it yes commandant says the other and the very next day the upholsterer man signed the lease with monsieur bras rouge in his own name mind you and further paid six months in advance because he said the gentleman did not wish to be bored about references and such a power of fine furniture as was sent into the first floor so feces sarcophagus curtains all silk glasses set in gold and everything you can mention all beautiful enough to astonish you just for all the world like one of them grand cafes on the boulevards as for the carpets oh you never trod on the like of them i'll be bound put your foot on them and you'd fancy you was stepping on velvet and take it off again for fear of spoiling it when everything was completed the commandant came to look at it just to see if he could find out anything more he wanted but he could not so then he spoke to alfred and says he could you take charge of my rooms and keep them in nice order light fires from time to time and get them ready for me when i wish to occupy them i shall not be here often says he and would always write you a line before coming to give you time to prepare them yes commandant i can answers my flatterer of an alfred and what shall you charge twenty francs a month commandant 
twenty francs exclaimed the commandant why porter you are jesting surely and hereupon he began baiting alfred down in the most shabby manner trying to squeeze poor people like us out of two or three miserable francs when he had been squandering thousands in fitting up his grand apartments which after all he did not mean to live in however after a deal of battling we got twelve francs a month out of him a paltry pitiful two farthing captain what a difference now between you and him added the porteress addressing rodolph with an admiring glance you don't call yourself fine names and titles you only look like a plain body you must be poor or you would not perch yourself on the fourth floor and yet you agreed with me for six francs without attempting to bait me down and when did the commandant pay you his next visit i'll tell you and good fun it is do my gentleman must have been nicely choused by somebody three times did he write same as to-day ordering us to light a fire and have everything ready for the reception of a lady he expected would come come yes i dare say he may expect a long time first i rather think nobody came then listen the first time the commandant arrived strutting and swelling like a turkey cock humming and singing after his manner all the gay tunes of the day walking up and down his fine room with his hands stuck in his pockets and occasionally stopping to arrange his hair before the glass we were watching him all the time well this went on for two or three hours when i suppose he knew it was no use waiting any longer so he came downstairs very softly and with quite a different manner to the pride and consequence he had marched up with by a way of teasing him people and i went out to him and said commandant there has been no lady whatever to inquire for you very well very well exclaimed he half mad and half ashamed of being laughed at and buttoning up his coat he walked off as fast as he could the next time before he came himself a small note was brought here by a man directed to m charles i strongly suspected he was done again and Piplet and me were enjoying a good hearty laugh over it when the commandant arrived captain says i putting the back of my hand up to my wig by way of military salute here is a letter for you but i am afraid it contains news of a second countermarch against you he looked at me sour as a crab snatched the letter from my hand read it turned scarlet as a boiled lobster then walked off pretending to whistle but he was finally vexed ready to hang himself i could see he was and it was rare nuts to me go and swallow that pill my two farthing captain says i to myself that serves you right for only giving twelve francs a month for minding your apartments and the third time ah the third time i really thought it was all right the commandant arrived more stuck up with pride than ever his eyes staring with self-satisfied admiration at himself and the certainty of not being disappointed this time let me tell the truth about him he really is a good-looking man and dresses well though he stinks of must like a civet cat well there was my gentleman arrayed in all his finery and scarcely condescending to look at us poor folks he seemed as though he conferred a favour on the earth by deigning to walk on it and went sticking his nose into the air as if he meant to touch the clouds with it he took the key and said to us as he passed upstairs in a jeering self-complacent tone as though to revenge himself for having been laughed at twice before you will direct the lady to my apartments when she comes well Piplet and i were so anxious to see the lady he expected though we did not much reckon upon her keeping her appointment even if she ever made one that we went and hid ourselves behind the little door that belongs to the alley and behold in a short time a blue hackney coach with its blinds drawn down stopped at the entrance to the house there she is says i to alfred there is his madame let's keep back a bit for fear we frighten her away the coachman got off his box and opened the door then we saw a female closely covered with a black veil and carrying a muff she had apparently been crying for she kept her handkerchief to her face 
for when the steps were let down, instead of alighting, she said some few words to the driver, who, much surprised, shut the door up again. Then the lady did not get out? No. She threw herself back in the coach and pressed her handkerchief tightly to her eyes. I rushed out, and before the coachman had time to get on his seat again, I called out, Hello there, coachy. Are you going back again? Yes, says he. Where, says I? Where I came from, answers he. And where did you come from, asks I again. From the Rue Saint-Dominique, corner of the Rue Bellechasse. Rodolphe started at these words. His dearest friend, the Marquis d'Arville, who, as elsewhere stated, had been for some time laboring under a deep melancholy none could penetrate, lived in the very place just mentioned by Madame Pipelet. Could this mysterious female in the blue fiacre be the Marquise d'Arville? And was it from the lightness and frivolity of her conduct that the mind of her excellent husband was bowed down by doubts and misgivings? These painful suggestions crowded on Rodolphe's mind, but although well acquainted with all the various guests received by the marquise, he could recollect no one answering the description of the commandant. Added to which, any female might have taken a hackney coach from that spot without necessarily living in the street. There was really nothing to identify the unknown of the blue fiacre with Madame d'Arville, and yet a thousand vague fears and painful suspicions crossed his mind. His uneasy manner and deep abstraction did not escape the portress. "'What are you thinking of, sir?' asked she at length. "'I was wondering what could have induced the lady, after coming to the very door, to change her mind so suddenly.' "'There is no saying. Some sudden thought, dread or fear. For we poor women are but weak cowardly things,' said the portress, assuming a timid, frightened manner. "'Well,' I think if it had been myself now, coming secretly to visit Alfred, I should have had to try back a great many times before I could have screwed up my courage to venture in. But then, as far as visiting your great dance in this kind of way, I never could have done such a thing. No, never. I am sure there is nobody under the face of heaven can say I ever give them the least freedom. I should think not, indeed while my poor dear old darling of a husband is left. No doubt, no doubt, Madame Pipelet. But about the young person you were describing in the blue fiacre. Oh, mind, I don't know whether she was young or old. I could not even catch a glimpse of the tip of her nose. All I can say is she went as she came, and that is all about it. As for Alfred and me, we were pleased than if we had found ten francs. Why so? by enjoying the rage and confusion of the commandant when he found himself a third time disappointed. But instead of going and telling him at once that his madame had been and gone, we allowed him to fume and fret for a whole hour. Then I went softly upstairs with only my list slippers on. I reached his door, which I found half shut. As I pushed against it, it creaked. The staircase is as black as night and the entrance to the apartment quite as obscure. Scarcely had I crept into the room when the commandant caught me in his arms, saying in a languishing voice, My dearest angel, what makes you so late? In spite of the serious nature of the thoughts crowding upon his mind, Rodolph could not restrain a smile as he surveyed the grotesque periwig and hideously wrinkled, carbuncled visage of the heroine of this comic scene. Madame Pipelet, however, resumed her narration with a mirthful chuckle that increased her ugliness. There was a go, wasn't it? But stop a bit. Well, I did not make the least reply, but almost keeping in my breath, I waited to see what would be the end of this strange reception. For a minute or two the commandant kept hugging me up. Then, all of a sudden, the brute pushed me away, exclaiming with as much disgust as though he had touched a toad who the devil are you me commandant the porteress madame pipelet and as such i will thank you to keep your hands off my waist and not to call me your angel and scold me for being late suppose alfred had heard you a pretty business we should have made of it what the deuce brings you here cried he merely to let you know the lady in the hackney coach has just arrived 
well then you stupid old fool show her up directly did i not tell you to do so yes commandant you said i was to show her up then why do you not obey me because the lady speak out woman if you can the lady has gone again something you have said or done then to offend her i am sure roared he in a perfect fury not at all commandant the lady did not alight but when the coach stopped and the driver opened the door she desired him to take her back to where she came from the vehicle could not have got far by this time exclaimed the commandant hastening towards the door it has been gone upwards of an hour answered i enjoying his fury and disappointment an hour an hour and what in devil's name hindered you from letting me know this sooner because commandant alfred and i thought we would spare you as long as we could the tidings of this third breakdown which we fancied might be too much for you come thinks i there is something to make you remember flinging me out of your arms as though it made you sick to touch me be gone bawled out the commandant you hideous old hag you can neither say nor do the thing that is right and with this he pulled off his dressing-gown and threw his beautiful greek cap made of velvet embroidered with gold on the ground it was a real shame for the cap was a downright beauty and as for the dressing-gown oh my it would set anybody longing meanwhile the commandant kept pacing the room with his eyes glaring like a wild beast and glowing like two glow-worms but were you not afraid of losing his employ he knew too well what he was about for that we had him in a fix we knew where his madame lived and had he said anything to us we should have threatened to expose the whole affair and who do you think for his beggarly twelve francs would have undertaken to attend to his rooms a stranger no that we would have prevented we would soon have made the place too hot to hold any person he might appoint poor shabby fellow that he is what do you think he actually had the meanness to examine his wood and put out the quantity he should allow to be burnt while he was away he is nothing but an upstart i am sure a nobody who has suddenly tumbled into money he does not know how to spend properly a rich man's head and a beggar's body who squanders with one hand and nips and pinches with the other i do not wish him any harm but it amuses me immensely to think how he has been befooled and he will go on believing and expecting from day to day because he is too vain to imagine he's being laughed at at any rate if the lady ever comes in reality i will let my friend the oyster woman next door know she enjoys a joke as well as i do and is quite as curious as myself to find out what sort of person she is whether fair or dark pretty or plain and who knows this woman may be cheating some easy-going simpleton of a husband for the sake of our two-penny half-penny of a commandant well that is no concern of mine but i am sorry too for the poor dear deceived individual whoever he may be dear me dear me my pot is boiling over excuse me a minute i must just look to it ah it is time alfred was in for dinner is quite ready and tripe you know should never be kept waiting this tripe is done to a turn do you prefer the thick or thin tripe alfred likes it thick the poor darling has been sadly out of spirits lately and i got this dainty dish to cheer him up a bit for as alfred says himself that for a bribe of good thick tripe he would betray france itself his beloved france yes the dear old pet would change his country for such fine fat tripe as this he would End of chapter 23, part 1
had evidently long struggled with her imprudence ere she had brought herself to grant a first and second rendezvous and then terrified at the probable consequences of her imprudence a salutary remorse had in all probability prevented her from fulfilling her dangerous engagement it might be that the fine person this m charles was described as possessing had captivated the senses of madame d'harville whom rodolph knew well as a woman of deep feeling high intellect and superior taste of an elevated turn of mind and a reputation unsullied by the faintest breath of slander after long and mature consideration he succeeded in persuading himself that the wife of his friend had nothing to do with the unknown female in the blue fiacre madame pipelet having completed her culinary arrangements resumed her conversation with rodolph and who lives on the second floor inquired he of the porteress why mother burette does a most wonderful woman at fortune-telling bless you she can read in your hand the same as a book and many quite first-rate people come to her to have the cards consulted when they are anxious about any particular matter she earns her weight in gold and that is not a trifle for she is a rare bundle of an old body however telling fortunes is only one of her means of gaining a livelihood why what does she do besides she keeps what you call a pawnbroker's shop upon a small scale i see your second-floor lodger lends out again the money she derives from her skill in foretelling events by reading the cards exactly so only she is cheaper and more easy to deal with than the regular pawnbrokers she does not confuse you with a heap of paper tickets and duplicates nothing of the sort now suppose some one brings mother burette a shirt worth three francs well she lends ten sous upon condition of being paid twenty at the end of the week otherwise she keeps the shirt for ever that is simple enough is it not always in round figures you see a child could understand it and the odd things she has brought her as pledges you would scarcely believe you can hardly guess what she sometimes is asked to lend upon i saw her once advance money upon a grey parrot that swore like a trooper the blackguard did a parrot but to what amount did she advance money i'll tell you the parrot was well known it belonged to a madame herbelot the widow of a factor living close by and it was also well understood that madame herbelot valued the parrot as much as she did her life well mother burette said to her i will lend you ten francs on your bird but if by this day week at twelve o'clock i do not receive twenty francs with interest it would amount to that in round numbers if i am not paid my twenty francs with the expenses of his keep i shall give your polly a trifling dose of arsenic mixed with his food she knew her customer well bless you however by this threat mother burette received her twenty francs at the end of seven days and madame herbelot got back her disagreeable screaming parrot mother burette has no other way of living besides the two you have named i suppose not that i know of i don't know however what to say of some rather sly and secret transactions carried on in a small room she never allows any one to enter except m bras rouge and an old one-eyed woman called la chouette rodolph opened his eyes with unmixed astonishment as these names sounded on his ear and the porteress interpreting the surprise of her future lodger according to her own notion said that name would make any one stare with astonishment certainly la chouette is uncommonly odd is it not it is indeed does the woman who is so styled come here frequently we saw her the day before yesterday for the first time these six weeks she was rather lame i observed and what do you suppose she wants with the fortune-telling woman that i do not know at least as to what takes place in the little room i was telling you of where la chouette alone is admitted with m bras rouge and mother burette i have however particularly observed that on those occasions the one-eyed woman always has a large bundle with her in her basket and that m bras rouge also carries a parcel of some size beneath his cloak and that they always return empty-handed and what can these packets contain the lord above knows for i don't only they kick up the devil's own row with them whatever they are and then such whiffs of sulphur charcoal and melted lead as you go up the stairs 
and blow 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 like a smith's forge i verily believe mother burette has dealings with the old one and practices magic in this private apartment leastways that is what m cesar bradamanti our third-floor lodger said to me a very clever individual is m cesar when i say an individual i mean an italian though he speaks as good french as you or me excepting his accent and that is nothing oh he is very clever indeed knows all about physic and pulls out teeth not for the sake of the money but the honour of his profession yes really sir for downright honour now suppose you had six decayed teeth and he says the same thing to all who choose to listen to him well then he will take out five for nothing and only charge you for the six besides which he sells all manner of remedies for all sorts of complaints diseases of the lungs coughs colds every complaint you can name but then he makes his own drugs and he has for his assistant the son of our principal lessee little tortillard he says that his master is going to buy himself a horse and a red coat and to sell his drugs in the market-places and that young tortillard is to be dressed like a page and be at the drum to attract customers this seems to me a very humble occupation for the son of your principal lessee why his father says unless he gets a pretty strong hand over him and a tolerably powerful taste of whipcord in the way of a sound thrashing every now and then he is safe to come to the scaffold and he is about the ugliest most spiteful ill-disposed young rascal one could wish to meet he has played more than one abominable trick upon poor m cesar bradamanti who is the best creature possible for he cured alfred of a rheumatic attack and i promise you we have not forgotten it yet there are some people wicked enough to but no i will not tell you it would make the hair of your head stand on end as alfred says if it were true it would send him to the galleys why what do you accuse him of oh i really cannot tell you i can't indeed for it is so then we will drop the subject and to say such things of a young man upon my life and soul it is too bad pray madame pipelet do not give yourself the trouble of saying any more about it let us speak of other matters why i don't know but as you are to live in the house it is only fair and right to prepare you for any falsehoods you may hear i suppose you are sufficiently well off to make the acquaintance of m cesar bradamanti and unless you are put on your guard against these reports they might lead you to your breaking off with him so just put your ear down and i'll whisper what it is people say about him and the old woman in a low tone muttered a few words as rodolph inclined his head he started from her with mingled disgust and horror impossible exclaimed he surely human nature is not capable of such crimes shocking is it not but treat it as i do all scandals and lies what do you think the man who cured alfred's rheumatism who draws five teeth out of six for nothing who has testimonies testimonials from every prince and king in the world and above all pays as he goes down on the nail would go for to do such things not he i'll stake my blessed life upon it while madame pipelet thus vented her indignant opinion concerning the reports in circulation rodolph recalled to his memory the letter he had seen addressed to the quack dentist he remembered the counterfeited writing and the coarse common paper stained with tears which had well-nigh obliterated part of the address too well did he see in the mysterious grief-stained epistle the opening of a drama of deep and fearful import and while these sad presages filled his mind a powerful impression whispered within him that the dreadful doings ascribed to the italian were not altogether unfounded oh i declare here comes alfred exclaimed the portress now he will tell you his opinion of all these spiteful stories about poor m bradamanti bless you alfred thinks him as innocent as a lamb ever since he cured his rheumatics m pipelet entered the lodge with a grave magisterial air he was about sixty years of age comfortably fat 
with a large broad countenance strongly resembling in its cast and style the faces carved upon the far-famed nutcrackers of nuremberg a nose of more than ordinary proportions helping to complete the likeness an old and dingy-looking hat with a very deep brim surmounted the whole alfred who adhered to this upper ornament as tenaciously as his wife did to her brutus wig was further attired in an ancient green coat with immense flaps turned up with grease if so might be described the bright and shiny patches of long accumulated dirt which had given an entirely different hue to some portions of the garment but though clad in a hat and coat esteemed by piplet and his wife as closely resembling full dress alfred had not laid aside the modest emblem of his trade but from his waist uprose the buff-coloured triangular front of his leathern apron partly concealing a waistcoat boasting nearly as great a variety of colours as did the patchwork counterpane of madame piplet the porter's recognition of rodolph as he entered was gracious in the extreme but alas he smiled a melancholy welcome and his countenance and languid air marked a man of secret sorrow alfred said madame piplet when she had introduced her two companions here is a gentleman after the apartment on the fourth floor and we have only been waiting for you to drink a glass of cordial he sent for this delicate attention won for rodolph the entire trust and confidence of the melancholy porter who touching the brim of his hat said in a deep bass voice worthy of being employed in a cathedral we shall give the gentleman every satisfaction as porters and doubtless he will act the same by us as a lodger birds of a feather flock together as the proverb says then interrupting himself m pipelet anxiously added providing sir you are not a painter no i am not a painter but a plain merchant's clerk my most humble duty to you sir i congratulate you that nature did not make you one of those monsters called artists artists monsters returned rodolph tell me pray why you style them so instead of replying m pipelet elevated his clasped hands towards the ceiling and allowed a heavy sound between a grunt and a groan to escape his overcharged breast you must know sir said madame pipelet in a low tone to rodolph that painters have embittered alfred's life they have worried my poor old dear almost out of his senses and made him half stupefied as you see him now then speaking loud she added in a caressing tone oh never mind the black guard there's a dear but try and forget all about it or you will be ill and unable to eat the nice tripe i have got for your dinner let us hope i shall have courage and firmness enough for all things replied m pipelet with a dignified and resigned air but he has done me much harm he has been my persecutor almost my executioner long have i suffered but now i despise him ah said he turning to rodolph never allow a painter to enter your doors they are the plague the ruin the destruction of a house you have then had a painter lodging with you i presume unhappily sir i did have one replied m pipelet with much bitterness and that one named cabrillon ah at the recollections brought back by this name the porter's declaration of courage and endurance utterly failed him and again his clenched fists were raised as though to invoke the vengeance he had so lately described himself as despising and was this individual the last occupant of the chamber i am about engaging inquired rodolph no no the last lodger was an excellent young man named m germain no this cabrillon had the room before he came ah sir since cabrillon left he has all but driven me stark staring mad did you then so much regret him asked rodolph regret him regret cabrillon screamed the astounded porter why only imagine m bras rouge paid him two quarters rent to induce him to quit the place for unluckily he had taken his apartments for a term what a scamp he was you have no idea of the horrible tricks he played off upon all the lodgers as well as us why just to give you one little proof of his villainy there was hardly a single wind instrument he did not make use of as a sort of annoyance to the lodgers from the french horn to the flageolet he made use of all and even carried his rascality so far as to play false and to keep blowing the same note for hours together it was enough to worry one out of one's senses 
well i suppose there were upwards of twenty different petitions sent to our chief lessee monsieur bras rouge to turn the beggar out and at last he was only got rid of by paying him two quarters rent rather droll is it not for a landlord to pay his lodger but bless you the house was so upset by him that he might have had any price so he would but take himself off however he did go and now you suppose we were clear of monsieur gabrion i'll tell you next night about eleven o'clock i was in bed when rap 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 comes to the gate i pulls up the string nobody walks up to my door how do you do porter says a voice will you oblige me with a lock of your hair somebody has mistaken the door says my wife so i calls out to the stranger you are wrong friend you want next door i think not returns the voice this is number seventeen is it not and the porter's name is pipelet i'm all right so please to open the door and oblige me with a lock of your beautiful hair my name is pipelet certainly answers i well then friend pipelet cabrion has sent me for a piece of your hair he says he must and he will have it as pipelet uttered the last words he gave his head a mournful shake and folding his arms assumed an attitude of martyr-like resolution do you perceive sir he sends to me his mortal enemy whom he overwhelmed with insults and continually outraged in every way to beg a lock of my hair a favour which even ladies have been known to refuse to a lover but supposing this cabrion had been as good a lodger as was m germain replied rodolph with some difficulty preserving the gravity of countenance do you think you might have accorded him the favour not to the best lodger that treads shoe-leather would i grant a similar request replied the man in the flapped hat waving it majestically over his brows as he spoke it is contrary to my principles and habits to give my hair to any one only i should have refused with the most scrupulous regard to politeness that is not all chimed in the porteress only conceive sir the abominable conduct of that cabrillon who from morning to night at all hours and at all times sends a swarm of vagabonds like himself to ask alfred for a lock of his hair always for cabrillon ah uh, monsieur sighed out poor pipelet had i committed the most atrocious crimes my sleep could not have been rendered more broken and unrefreshing scarcely do i fall into a doze than i wake starting with the idea of being called by that cursed cabrillon i suspect everybody in each person who approaches me i see an emissary from my persecutor come to request a lock of my hair i am losing my good spirits my temper and becoming gloomy suspicious peevish and ill-natured this infernal cabrillon has murdered my whole life and pipelet heaved so profound a sigh that his hat vibrating for some time from the consequences of the convulsive shake of the head occasioned thereby fell forward and completely veiled his care-stricken features i can well understand now said rodolph that you are not particularly partial to painters but i suppose the monsieur germain you were praising so highly made up for the bad treatment you received from monsieur cabrion yes yes sir as i told you monsieur germain was a delightful young man so honourable and kind-hearted open as the day and ever ready to serve and oblige he was cheerful and merry as need be but then he always kept his high spirits within proper bounds instead of worrying people to death by his unmeaning hoaxes like that cabrion who i wish was at the devil come come my good monsieur pipelet i must not let you thus excite yourself and who now is the person fortunate enough to possess such a pattern of a lodger as this monsieur germain seems to have been that is more than i can tell you no one knows whither he has gone nor are they likely except indeed through mademoiselle rigolette and who is mademoiselle rigolette demanded rodolph why she is a needlewoman also living on the fourth floor cried madame pipelet another pattern lodger always pays her rent in advance and keeps her little chamber so nice and clean 
then she is well behaved to every one so merry and happy like a bird though poor thing very like a caged bird obliged to work early and late to earn two francs a day and often not half that let her try ever so hard how does it happen that mademoiselle rigolette should be the only person entrusted with the secret of m germain's present abode why when he was going away he came to us and said returned madame pipelet i do not expect any letters but if by chance any should come please to give them to mademoiselle rigolette and she is well worthy of his confidence if his letters were filled with gold don't you think so alfred the fact is said the porter in a severe tone that i know no harm of mademoiselle rigolette excepting her permitting herself to be wheedled over by that vile scamp cabrion but you know alfred that nothing more than a few harmless attentions passed between them interrupted the portress for though mademoiselle rigolette is as merry as a kitten she is as prudent and correct as i am myself you should see the strong bolts she has inside her door and if her next-door neighbour will make love to her that is not her fault it follows as a matter of course when people are so close to each other it was just the same with the travelling clerk we had here before cabrion and so it was when m germain took the room this abominable painter occupied so as i say there is no blame to mademoiselle rigolette it arises out of the two rooms joining one another so closely naturally that brings about a little flirtation but nothing more so then it becomes a matter of course does it said rodolph that every one who occupies the apartment i am to have should make love to mademoiselle rigolette why of course monsieur how can you be good neighbours without it don't you see now imagine yourself lodging in the very next room to a nice pretty obliging young person like mademoiselle rigolette well then young people will be young people sometimes you want a light sometimes a few live coals to kindle up your fire maybe a little water for one is sure always to find plenty of fresh spring water at mademoiselle rigolette's she is never without it it is her only luxury she is like a little duck always dabbling in it and if she does happen to have a little leisure such a washing down of floors and cleaning of windows never the least soil or neglect about either herself or her apartment and so you will find and so m germain by reason of his close proximity to mademoiselle rigolette became what you style upon perfectly neighbourly terms with her oh bless you yes why the two seemed cut out for each other so young and so good-looking it was quite a pleasure to look at them as they came downstairs of a sunday to take the only walk poor things they could afford themselves throughout the week she dressed in a smart little cap and a gown that cost probably not more than twenty-five sous the ell but made by herself and that so tastily that it became her as much as though it had been of satin he mind ye dressed and looking like a regular gentleman and m germain has not been to see mademoiselle rigolette i suppose since he quitted the house no monsieur unless on sunday for mademoiselle rigolette has no time during the other six days of the week to think of sweethearting why the poor girl rises at five or six o'clock and works incessantly till ten or eleven o'clock at night never once leaving her room except for a few minutes in the morning when she goes out to buy food for herself and her two canary birds and the three eat but very little just a penworth of milk a little bread some chickweed bird seed and clear fresh water and the whole three of them sing away as merrily as though they fared ever so sumptuously and mademoiselle rigolette is kind and charitable too as far as lies in her power that is to say she gives her time her sleep and her services for poor girl she can scarcely manage to keep herself by working closely for twelve hours a day those poor unfortunate creatures in the attics whom m bras rouge is going to turn into the streets in two or three days time if even he waits so long why mademoiselle rigolette and m germain sat up with the children night after night you have a distressed family then here distressed oh god bless you my good sir i think we have indeed why there are five young children and almost dying mother and idiotic grandmother 
and their only support a man who though he slaves like a negro cannot even get bread enough to eat and a capital workman he is too three hours sleep out of the twenty-four is all he allows himself and what sleep it is broken by his children crying for food by the groans of his sick wife tossing on her miserable straw bed or the idiotic screams of the poor bedridden old grandmother who sometimes howls like a wolf from hunger too for poor creature she has not sense or reason to know better and when she gets very hungry you may hear cries and screams all down the staircase horrible exclaimed rodolph with a shudder and does no one afford them any assistance truly sir we do all we can we are but poor ourselves however since the commandant has allowed me his paltry twelve francs a month for looking after his apartments i have managed once a week to make a little broth for these poor unfortunate creatures mademoiselle rigolette deprives herself of her night's rest and sits up poor girl though it burns her candles contriving out of one bit and the other of her cutting out to make up a few clothes for the children sometimes from the morsels left at her work she manages a small nightcap or gown and m germain who had not a franc more than he knew what to do with used to pretend from time to time that he had received a present of a few bottles of wine from his friends and morel that is the name of the workman with the sick family was sure to be invited to share it with him and it was really wonderful to see how refreshed and strengthened poor morel used to seem after m germain had made him take a good pull at his wine to put as he used to say a little life and soul into his half-exhausted body and the surgeon dentist what did he do for this wretched family m bradamanti said the porter ah he cured my rheumatism and i owe him my eternal gratitude but from that day i said to my wife anastasia m bradamanti hum hum did i not say so anastasia exactly that is precisely what you did say but i want to know what this m bradamanti did to assist the poor starving beings in your garrets why you see monsieur when i mentioned to m bradamanti the misery and utter destitution of poor morel by the way he first began the conversation by complaining that the raving and screaming of the old idiot woman throughout the night for food prevented him from sleeping and that he found it very unpleasant however he listened to my description of the state the whole family was in and then he said well if they are so much distressed you may tell them that if they want any teeth drawn i will excuse them paying even for the sixth i tell you what madame pipelet said rodolph i have a decidedly bad opinion of this man and your female pawnbroker was she more charitable very much after the fashion of m bradamanti said the porteress she lent a few sous upon their wretched clothes every garment they had passed into her hands and even their last mattress but they were not long coming to the last for they never had but two but she gave them no further aid help them poor creatures not she mother burette is as great a brute in her way as her lover m bras rouge is in his for between you and i added the porteress with an uncommonly annoying wink of the eye and a sagacious shake of the head there is something rather tender going on between these two really cried rodolph i think so i do upon my life and why not why the folks in st martin are as loving as the rest of the world are they not my old pet a melancholy shake of the head which produced a corresponding motion in the huge black hat was m pipelet's only answer as for madame pipelet since she had begun expressing sympathy for the poor sufferers in the attics her countenance had ceased to strike rodolph as repulsive and he even thought it wore an agreeable expression and what is this poor morel's trade a maker of false jewellery he works by the piece but dear me that sort of work is so much imitated and so cheaply got up that for a man can but work his best and he cannot do more than he can besides when you have got to find bread for seven persons without reckoning yourself it is rather a hard job i take it and though his eldest daughter does her best to assist the family she has but very little in her power 
how old is this daughter about eighteen and as lovely a young creature as you would see in a long summer's day she lives as servant with an old miserly fellow rich enough to buy and sell half of paris a notary named m jacques ferrand m jacques ferrand exclaimed rodolph surprised at the fresh coincidence which brought under his notice the very individual from whom or from whose confidential housekeeper he expected to glean so many particulars relative to la goualeuse m jacques ferrand who lives in the rue du sentier do you mean inquired he the very same are you acquainted with him not at all but he does the law business for the firm i belong to ah then you must know that he is a regular money-grubbing old usurer but then let me do the man justice he is strictly religious and devout as a monk never absent from mass or vespers making his easter offerings and going regularly to confession if he ever enjoys himself it is only along with the priests drinking holy water and eating blessed bread oh he is almost a saint in the strictness of his life but then his heart is as hard as iron and as stern and rigid towards others as he is severe towards himself why poor louise daughter to our sick lodger has been his only servant for the last eighteen months and what a good girl she is gentle as a lamb in temper and disposition but willing as a horse to work and he only gives this poor thing who slaves herself to death for him eighteen francs a month not a farthing more i give you my word and out of this she only keeps back six francs for her own maintenance and hands over the other twelve to her starving family that has been all their dependence for some time past but when seven persons have to live upon it it does not go far but what does the father earn i mean provided he is industrious industrious god bless you he has always overworked himself he is the soberest steadiest creature alive and i verily believe that if he had the promise of obtaining any favour he liked to ask of heaven it would be that the day might be made doubly as long as it now is that he might earn bread enough to stop the cries of his starving brats then the father cannot earn enough if he were to try ever so hard it seems why the poor man was ill abed for three months and that threw them all behind his wife's health was quite ruined by the fatigue of nursing him and the severe want she experienced of common necessaries for herself and family she now lies in a dying state they have had nothing for all that period besides louise's wages and what they could obtain from mother burette upon the few wretched articles they could dispose of true the master for whom morel had worked advanced them a trifle out of respect for a man he had always found punctual and honest when he could work but la eight people only to be found in bread that is what i say just imagine how hard it must be to keep life and soul together upon such small means and if you could only see the hole they are huddled together in but do not let us talk any more about that monsieur for our dinner is ready and the very thought of their wretched garret turns my stomach however happily m bras rouge is going to clear the house of them when i say happily i don't mean it ill-naturedly in the least but since these poor morels have fallen into such misery and it is quite out of our power to help them why let them go and be miserable elsewhere it will be a heartache the less for us all but if they are turned out from here where will they go truly i don't know and how much can this poor workman earn daily when in health and without any calls upon his time or attention why if he had not to attend to his old mother nurse his sick wife and look after the five children he could earn his three or four francs a day because he works like a downright slave but now that at least three-quarters of his time are taken up with the family he can hardly manage to earn forty sous that is little indeed poor creatures yes it is easy to say poor creatures but there are so many equally poor creatures that as we can do nothing for them it is no use to worry ourselves about it is it alfred and talking of consoling ourselves there stands the cassia and we have never thought of tasting it to tell you the truth madame pipelet 
after what I have just heard, I have no inclination to partake of it. You and Monsieur Pipelet must drink my health in it when I am gone. You are extremely kind, sir, said the porter. But will you not like to see the rooms upstairs? I shall be glad to do so, if perfectly convenient, and if they suit, I will engage them at once and leave a deposit. The porter, followed by Rodolph, emerged from the gloomy lodge and proceeded upstairs. End of chapter 23「ニュースミステリーのパリスパリスパリスパリスパリスパリスパリスパリスパリスパリスパリスパリスパリスパリスパリスパリスパリスパリスパリスパリスパリスパリスパリスパリスパリスパリスパリスパリスパリスパリスパリスパリスパリスパリスパリスパリスパリスパリスパリスパリスパリスパリスパリスパリスパリスパ Thus, the door conducting to those of the commandant bore evidences of having been recently painted in close imitation of ebony, being further set off with a brass knob rubbed up to a most dazzling brightness, while a gay colored bell rope, finished by an enormous tassel of scarlet silk, contrasted strongly with the mean and shabby wall against which it hung. The door of the flight above, where dwelt the female moneylender and dealer in divination, was singularly characterized by the appearance of that mystical symbol of deep wisdom and oracular knowledge, an owl, which, stuffed to resemble life as closely as the artist could contrive it, was nailed on a small bracket just above the doorway, while a sort of small wicket, latticed with wire work, enabled all visitors to be duly scrutinized ere they were admitted. The dwelling of the Italian charlatan, who was said to pursue such fearful avocations, had likewise, Its whimsical mode of designating the pursuits of its occupant, whose name traced in large letters formed of horse's teeth upon a square blackboard, was nailed to the entrance door. While instead of adopting the classical agency of a deer's foot or a hare's pad for the handle of his bell, there hung dangling from the cord the hand and arm of a dried ape. The withered limb, the shriveled hand, with its five fingers, each so distinctly preserved, and the articulation of every joint so clearly defined, The tiny tips bearing the nails long and taper as those of a human creature presented a close and hideous resemblance to the hand and arm of a child. As Rodolph passed before a door so singularly indicative of all his worst suspicions, he fancied he could detect the sound of smothered sobs from within. Then rose up a cry so full of agony, of convulsive, irrepressible misery, a cry as if wrung from a breaking heart or the last wail of expiring nature. That the whole house seemed to re echo it. Rodolph started. Then, by a movement more rapid than thought itself, he rushed to the door and violently pulled the bell. What is the matter, sir? inquired the astonished porter. That cry, said Rodolph. Did you not hear it? Yes, yes, I heard it. I dare say it is some person whose teeth Mr. Bradamanti is taking out. Perhaps he may be taking out several, and it is painful. This explanation, though a probable one, did not satisfy Rodolph as to the horrid scream which still resounded in his ears. Though he had rung the bell with considerable violence, no person had as yet replied to his summons. He could distinctly hear the shutting of several doors, and then, behind a small oval glass let in beside the door, and on which Rodolph had mechanically kept his eyes fixed, he saw the haggard, cadaverous countenance of a human being. A mass of reddish hair strongly mixed with grey, and a long beard of the same hue, completed the hideous ensemble. The face was seen but for an instant, and vanished as quickly as though it had been a mere creation of fancy, leaving Rodolph in a state of perturbation impossible to describe. Short as had been the period of this apparition's visit, he had yet in those brief instants recalled features precisely similar and forever engraved on his memory. The eyes shining with the color and brilliancy of the aquamarina beneath their bushy sandy eyebrows, the livid complexion, the nose thin, projecting, and curving like an eagle's beak, with its nostrils so curiously expanded and carved out till they exposed a portion of the nasal cartilage, resembled closely a certain Polidori, whose name had been so unceremoniously committed by Murphy in his conversation with Graun, to regions not mentionable to polite ears. Though Rodolph had not seen Polidori during the last sixteen or seventeen years, he had a thousand reasons for keeping every feature well in his remembrance. 
the only thing that told against the identity of the individual he believed existed under the disguised name of this quack dentist was the circumstance of his having red hair while the polidori of rodolph's acquaintance had almost black that rodolph experienced no wonder always supposing his conjectures as to the identity correct at finding a man whose profound learning rare talent and vast intelligence he well knew sunk to such a degradation it might even be infamy was because he knew equally well that all these high attainments and noble gifts were allied to such entire perversity such wild and irregular passions inclinations so corrupt and above all an affected scorn and contempt for the opinion of the world which might lead this man when want and misery overtook him to seek from choice the lowest and least honourable pass of subsistence and to enjoy a sort of malevolent satisfaction in the idea of him the talented the learned burying all these precious treasures beneath the ignoble calling to which he had devoted his vast powers of mind and body still be it remembered that spite of the close resemblance between the charlatan surgeon dentist and the polidori of bygone years there still existed discrepancies so great that rodolph balanced in deep uncertainty respecting their proving to be one and the same person at length turning to Biplet, he inquired how long has this m bradamanti been an inmate of this house about a year sir as nearly as i can remember yes it is a year i recollect he took the lodgings in the january quarter oh he is a very regular and exact lodger he cured me of a desperate attack of rheumatism madame pipelet was telling me of the reports which are circulated of him how could she be so foolish nay pray do not fear me i assure you i may safely be trusted but really sir rejoined pipelet i do not think there is the least dependence to be placed in such reports i do not believe them for one i never can believe them my modesty would not let me added m pipelet turning very red and preceding his new lodger to the floor above the more resolved upon clearing up his doubts in proportion to the very great annoyance he felt that the residence of polidori in the same house would prove to him and becoming momentarily more disposed to affix a painful solution to the enigma of the piercing cry he had heard from the apartments of the italian rodolph bound himself by a rigid promise to investigate the matter so as to place it beyond the power of a doubt and followed the porter to the upper floor where was situated the chamber he was desirous of engaging it was easy to ascertain the abode of his next-door neighbour mademoiselle rigolette thanks to the charming gallantry of the painter pipelet's mortal foe the door of her chamber was ornamented after the manner of watteau with a panel design representing about half a dozen fat little chubby loves grouped round a space painted sky blue and on which was traced in pink letters mademoiselle rigolette dressmaker these plump little cupids had all a task to perform besides encircling this important announcement one held the thimble of mademoiselle rigolette upon his tiny finger another held her scissors a third was provided with a smoothing iron for her use whilst a fourth held up a mirror as if to tempt the young sempstress to forsake her work for the more gratifying view of her own pretty countenance the whole was surrounded with a well-chosen wreath of flowers whose gay colours contrasted agreeably with the sea-green colour of the door the whole offering a very unfavourable contrast to the mean and shabby-looking staircase at the risk of opening anew the bleeding wounds of alfred rodolph ventured to observe while pointing to the door of mademoiselle rigolette this i suppose is the work of m cabrion it is he destroyed the painting of the door by daubing it over with a parcel of fat indecent children he called his loves had it not been for the entreaties of mademoiselle rigolette and the weakness of m bras rouge i would have scratched it all off as well as this palette filled with horrid monsters with their equally abominable master whom you can see drawn amongst them you may know him by his steeple-crowned hat and there sure enough on the door of the room rodolph was about to hire might be seen a palette surrounded by all kinds of odd and whimsical creatures the witty conceit of which might have done honour to callot rodolph followed the porter into a tolerably good-sized room accessible by a small entrance closet or antechamber having two windows opening into the rue du temple some fantastic sketches from the pencil of m cabrion on the second door 
had been scrupulously respected by Monsieur Germain. Rodolph saw too many reasons for desiring to obtain this lodging to hesitate further. Therefore, modestly placing a couple of francs in the hand of the porter, he said, This chamber will exactly suit me. Here is a deposit to complete the bargain. Tomorrow I will send in my furniture. But let me beg of you not to destroy the merry creatures painted on the palette at the entrance. It is really very droll, don't you think so? Droll? groaned poor Piplet. Not I. Ah, sir, how would you like to dream night after night that you were being hunted by a legion of little ugly devils like these on the door, with Cabrillon at their head urging them on, and then fancying you are trying to get away and cannot? Oh, I have woke all in a perspiration from such dreams hundreds of times since that infamous Cabrillon began persecuting me. Why, honestly speaking, I cannot say the chase would be a very agreeable one, even though but a dream. However, tell me, have I any need to see Monsieur Bras Rouge, your great man here, about renting this apartment? None whatever, sir. He rarely comes near the place except when he has any private matters to arrange with Mother Burette. I am the only person to treat with about hiring apartments. I must beg the favor of your name. Rodolphe. Rodolphe what? Plain Rodolphe, Monsieur Piplet. Nothing more, if you please. Just as you please, sir. I did not ask from curiosity. Every man has a right to his own free will, as well as to decide upon the name he chooses to be called. What do you think, Monsieur Piplet, as to the propriety of my going to-morrow, as a new neighbor of Morel's, to inquire whether I can be of any service to them? Since my predecessor, Monsieur Germain, was permitted to assist them according to his means, why should they not accept of what trifling help I can afford? Why, sir, I see no harm in your going to call on the Morel's, because it may please the poor things. But I hardly see much good it can do as they are so shortly to be turned out of the house. Then, as if suddenly struck with a new idea, M. Piplet exclaimed, winking at Rodolph with what he intended should be a very facetious and penetrating look, I see, I see. You mean to begin making acquaintance with the lodgers at the top of the house, that you may be able to work your way down to Mademoiselle Rigolette. Ah, I have found you out, you see. Pretty girl! Well, I think you have discovered my intentions, so I will confess at once that I mean to try and be on friendly terms with my agreeable neighbor. There is no harm in that, sir. It is customary. Only all correct, all right, and honorable, you understand. Between you and me, I strongly suspect Mademoiselle Rigolette heard us coming upstairs, and that she is watching to have a look as we go down. I will make a noise purposely in locking the door. If you look sharp, you will see her as we pass the landing. And true to the porter's suspicions, the door, so tastefully enlivened by the fat cupids à la Watteau, was seen to open gently, and Rodolphe had a brief view of a little turned-up nose and a pair of large staring black eyes peeping through the narrow space. But as he slacked his steps, the door was hastily shut. I told you she was watching us, said the porter, then added, "'Excuse me one instant, sir. I want to step up to my warehouse. "'Where is that?' "'At the top of this ladder is the landing-place, on which the door of Morel's garret opens, "'and in the wainscoting of this landing is a small dark cupboard, where I keep my leather, "'and the wall is so full of cracks, that when I am in this hole I can see and hear everything, "'the same as if I was in Morel's room. "'Not that I wish to spy what the poor creatures are about, God knows. "'Quite the contrary.' "'But please to excuse me for a few minutes, sir, "'whilst I fetch my bit of leather. "'If you will have the goodness to go downstairs, "'I will rejoin you.' "'And, so saying, Piplet commenced ascending the steep ladder "'communicating with his warehouse, as he styled it, "'a somewhat perilous feat for a person of his age. "'Rodolphe, thus left alone, "'cast another glance towards the chambers of Mademoiselle Rigolette, remembering with deep interest all he had heard of her being the favorite companion of the poor goualeuse and recalling also the information she was said to possess touching the residence of the schoolmaster's son when the sound of some person quitting the apartments of the quack doctor below attracted his attention and he could distinctly hear the light step of a female with the rustling of a silk dress 
Rodolph paused till the sounds had died away and then descended the stairs. Something white had fallen about halfway down. It had evidently been dropped by the person who had just quitted Polidori. Rodolph picked it up and carried it to one of the narrow windows which lighted the staircase. It was a pocket handkerchief of the finest cambric trimmed with costly lace and bearing in one corner the initials L. N., beautifully embroidered and surmounted with a ducal coronet. The handkerchief was literally soaked in tears. Rodolph's first impulse was to follow the person from whose hand this mute evidence of deep woe had fallen, with the view of restoring it, but, reflecting that such a step might be mistaken for impertinent curiosity, he determined to preserve it carefully, as the first link in an adventure he found himself almost involuntarily engaged in, and from which he augured a painful and melancholy termination. As he returned to the portress, he inquired whether a female had not just come downstairs. A female? No, indeed, sir. It was a fine, tall, slender-looking lady, not a female, and covered over with a thick black veil. She has come from Monsieur Bradamanti. Little Tortia fetched a coach for her, and she has just driven away in it. What struck me was the impudence of that little beggar to seat himself behind the coach. I dare say, though, it was to see where the lady went to, for he is as mischievous as a magpie, and as prying as a ferret, for all his club foot. So then, thought Rodolph, the name and address of this unhappy lady will soon be known to this impostor, since it is, doubtless, by his directions she is followed and watched by this imp of an emissary. Well, sir, and what do you think of the apartment? Will it suit you? inquired Madame Pipelet. Nothing could have suited me better. I have taken it, and tomorrow I shall send in my furniture. Well, thank God for a good lodger. I am sure it was a lucky chance for us sent you here. I hope you will find it so, madame. I think it is well understood between us that you undertake to manage all my little domestic matters for me. I shall come and superintend the removal of my goods. Adieu. So saying, Rodolph left the lodge. The results of his visit to the house in the Rue du Temple were highly important, both as regarded the solution of the deep mystery he so ardently desired to unravel, and also as affording a wide field for the exercise of his earnest endeavours to do good and to prevent evil. After mature calculation, he considered himself to have achieved the following results. First, he had ascertained that Mademoiselle Rigolette was in possession of the address of Germain, the schoolmaster's son. Secondly, a young female, who, from appearances, might unhappily be the Marquise d'Arville, had made an appointment with the commandant for the morrow, perhaps to her own utter ruin and disgrace. And Rodolphe had, as we have before mentioned, numerous reasons for wishing to preserve the honour and peace of one for whom he felt so lively an interest, as he took in all concerning M. d'Arville. An honest and industrious artisan, crushed by the deepest misery, was with his whole family about to be turned into the streets through the means of Bras Rouge. Further, Rodolphe had undesignedly caught a glimpse of an adventure in which the charlatan César Bradamanti, possibly Polidori, and a female, evidently of rank and fashion, were the principal actors. And finally, La Chouette, having lately quitted the hospital, where she had been since the affair in the Allée des Veuves, had reappeared on the stage, and was evidently engaged in some underhand proceedings with the fortune-teller and female money-lender who occupied the second floor of the house. Having carefully noted down all these particulars, Rodolphe returned to his house, Rue Plumet, deferring till the following day his visit to the notary Jacques Ferrand. It will be no doubt fresh in the memory of our readers that on this same evening Rodolphe was engaged to be present at a grand ball given by the ambassador of blank, before following our hero in this new excursion, let us cast a retrospective glance on Tom and Sarah, personages of the greatest importance in the development of this history. End of chapter 24 Chapter 25 of The Mysteries of Paris, Volume 1, by Eugène Sue. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 25 Tom and Sarah. 
Sarah Satan, widow of Count MacGregor, and at this time thirty-six or thirty-seven years of age, was of an excellent Scotch family, daughter of a baronet, and a country gentleman. Beautiful and accomplished, an orphan at seventeen years old, she had left Scotland with her brother, Thomas Satan of Halsbury. The absurd predictions of an old Highland nurse had excited almost to madness the two leading vices in Sarah's character, pride and ambition. The destiny predicted for her, and in which she fully believed, was of the highest order. In fact, sovereign rank. The prophecy had been so often repeated that the young Scotch girl eventually fully credited its fulfillment, and she constantly repeated to herself, to bear out her ambitious dream, that a fortune-teller had thus promised a crown to the handsome and excellent creature who afterwards sat on the throne of France, and who was queen as much by her graces and her kind heart as others have been by their grandeur and majesty. Strange to say, Thomas Satan, as superstitious as his sister, encouraged her foolish hopes, and resolved on devoting his life to the realization of Sarah's dream, a dream as dazzling as it was deceptive. However, the brother and sister were not so blind as to believe implicitly in this highland prophecy, and to look absolutely for a throne of the first rank in a splendid disdain of secondary royalties or reigning principalities. On the contrary, so that the handsome Scotch lassie should one day encircle her imperial head with a sovereign crown, the haughty pair agreed to condescend to shut their eyes to the importance of the throne they coveted. By the assistance of the Almanac de Gotha, for the year of grace 1819, Satan arranged before he left Scotland a sort of synopsis of the ages of all the kings and ruling powers in Europe then unmarried. Although very ridiculous, yet the brother and sister's ambition was freed from all shameful modes. Satan was prepared to aid his sister Sarah in snatching at the thread of the conjugal band by which she hoped eventually to fasten a crown upon her brows. He would be her participator in any and all stratagems which could tend to consummate this end. But he would rather have killed his sister than see her the mistress of a prince, even though the liaison should terminate in a marriage of reparation. The matrimonial inventory that resulted from Satan and Sarah's researches in the Almanac de Gotha was satisfactory. The Germanic Confederation furnished forth a numerous contingent of young presumptive sovereigns. Satan was not ignorant of the sort of German wedlock which is called a left-handed marriage, to which, as being legitimate to a certain extent, he would, as a last resource, have resigned his sister. To Germany, then, it was resolved to bend their steps, in order to commence this search for the royal spouse. If the project appears improbable, such hopes ridiculous, let us first reply by saying that unbridled ambition, excited by superstitious belief, rarely claims for itself the light of reason in its enterprises and will dare the wildest impossibilities yet when we recall certain events even in our own times from high and most reputable morganatic marriages between sovereigns and female subjects down to the loving elopement of miss penelope smith and the prince of capua we cannot refuse some chance of fortunate result to the imagination of satan and sarah let us add that the lady united to a very lovely person singular abilities and very varied talents whilst there were added a power of seduction the more dangerous as it was united to a mind unbending and calculating a disposition cunning and selfish a deep hypocrisy a stubborn and despotic will all covered by the outward show of a generous warm and impassioned nature in her appearance there was as much deceit as in her mind her full and dark eyes, now sparkling, now languishing, beneath her coal-black brow, could well dissimulate all the warmth of love and desire. Yet the burning impulses of love never throbbed beneath her icy bosom. No surprise of the heart or of the senses ever intervened to disturb the cold and pitiless calculations of this woman. Crafty, selfish, and ambitious. When she reached the continent, she resolved, in accordance with her brother's advice, not to commence her conjugal and regal campaign until she had resided some time in Paris, where she determined to complete her education and rub off the rust of her native country by associating with a society which was embellished by all that was elegant, tasteful, and refined. Sarah was introduced into the best society and the highest circles, thanks to the letters of recommendation and considerate patronage of the English ambassador's lady and the old Marquis d'Arville, who had known Tom and Sarah's father in England. 
persons of deceitful calculating and cold dispositions acquire with great facility language and manners quite in opposition to their natural character as with them all is outside surface appearance varnish bark or they soon find that if their real characters are detected they are undone so thanks to the sort of instinct of self-preservation with which they are gifted they feel all the necessity of the moral mask and so paint and costume themselves with all the alacrity and skill of a practised comedian thus after six months residence in paris sarah was in a condition to contest with the most parisian of parisian women as to the piquant finish of her wit the charm of her liveliness the ingenuousness of her flirtation and the exciting simplicity of her looks at once chaste and passionate finding his sister in full panoply for his campaign satan left with her for germany furnished with the best letters of introduction the first state of the german confederation which headed sarah's road-book was the grand duchy of gerolstein thus styled in the diplomatic and infallible almanach de gotha for the year of grace eighteen nineteen genealogy of the sovereigns of europe and their families gerolstein grand duke maximilian rodolph tenth december seventeen sixty four succeeded his father charles frederick rodolph twenty first april seventeen eighty five widower january eighteen hundred eight by decease of his wife louisa amelia daughter of john augustus prince of berglen son gustavus rodolph born seventeenth april eighteen hundred three mother dowager grand duchess judith widow of the grand duke charles frederick rodolph twenty first april seventeen eighty five satan with much practical good sense had first noted down on his list the youngest princes whom he coveted as brothers-in-law thinking that extreme youth is more easily seduced than ripened age moreover we have already said that the brother and sister were particularly recommended to the reigning duke of gerolstein by the old marquis d'harville caught like the rest of the world by sarah whose beauty grace and above all delightful manners he could not sufficiently admire it is superfluous to say that the presumptive heir of the grand duchy of gerolstein was gustavus rodolph he was hardly eighteen when tom and sarah were presented to his father the arrival of the young scotch lady was an event in the german court so quiet simple and almost patriarchal in its habits and observances the grand duke a most worthy gentleman governed his states with wise firmness and paternal kindness nothing could exceed the actual and moral happiness of the principality whose laborious and steady population by their soberness and piety presented a pure specimen of the german character this excellent people enjoyed so much real felicity and were so perfectly contented with their condition that the enlightened care of the grand duke was not much called into action to preserve them from the mania of constitutional innovations as far as modern discovery went and those practical suggestions which have a wholesome influence over the well-being and morals of his people the grand duke was always anxious to acquire knowledge himself and apply it invariably for the use and benefit of his people his residence at the capitals of the different states of europe having little else to occupy themselves whilst on their mission but to keep their master fully informed as to the rise and progress of science and all the arts which are connected with public welfare and public utility we have said that the duke felt as much affection as gratitude for the old marquis d'harville who in eighteen fifteen had rendered him immense service and so thanks to his powerful recommendation sarah of halsbury and her brother were received at the court of gerolstein with every distinction and with marked kindness a fortnight after her arrival the young scotch girl endued with so profound a spirit of observation had easily penetrated the firm character and open heart of the grand duke before she began to seduce his son a thing of course she had wisely resolved to discover the disposition of the father although he had appeared to dote on his son she was yet fully convinced that his father with all his tenderness would never swerve from certain principles certain ideas as to the duty of princes and would never consent to what he would consider a mesalliance for his son and that not through pride but from conscience reason and dignity a man of this firm mould and the more affectionate and good in proportion as he is firm and determined never abates one jot of that which affects his conscience his reason and his dignity sarah was on the point of renouncing her enterprise in the face of obstacles so insurmountable 
but reflecting that as rodolph was very young and his gentleness and goodness his character at once timid and meditative were generally spoken of she thought she might find compensation in the feeble and irresolute disposition of the young prince and therefore persisted in her project and again revived her hopes on this new essay the management of herself and brother were most masterly the young lady knew full well how to propitiate all around her and particularly the persons who might have been jealous or envious of her accomplishments and she caused her beauty and grace to be forgotten beneath the veil of modest simplicity with which she covered them she soon became the idol not only of the grand duke but of his mother the dowager grand duchess judith who in spite of or through her ninety years of age loved to excess everything that was young and charming sarah and her brother often talked of their departure but the sovereign of gerolstein would never consent to it and that he might completely attach the two to him he pressed on sir thomas satan the acceptance of the vacant post of his first groom of the chamber and entreated sarah not to quit the grand duchess judith as she could not do without her after much hesitation overcome by the most pressing entreaties sarah and satan accepted such brilliant offers and decided on establishing themselves at the court of gerolstein where they had been for two months sarah who was an accomplished musician knowing the taste of the grand duchess for the old masters and above all for gluck sent for the chef-d'oeuvre of this attractive composer and fascinated the old princess by her unfailing complaisance as well as the remarkable skill with which she sang those old airs so beautiful in their melody so expressive in their character as for satan he knew how to make himself very useful in the occupation which had been conferred upon him he was a good judge of horses was orderly and firm in his conduct and arrangements and so in a short time completely remodelled the stables of the grand duke which up to that time had been neglected and become disorganised the brother and sister were soon equally beloved feted and admired in this court the master's preference soon commands the preference of those below him sarah required in aid of her future projects too much aid not to employ her insinuating powers in acquiring partisans her hypocrisy clothed in most attractive shapes easily deluded the simple-hearted germans and the general feeling soon authorized the extreme kindness of the grand duke thus then our designing pair were established at the court of gerolstein agreeably and securely placed without any reference to rodolph by a lucky chance some days after the arrival of sarah the young prince had gone away to the inspection of troops with an aide-de-camp and the faithful murphy this absence doubly auspicious to the views of sarah allowed her to arrange at her ease the principal threads of the fillet she was weaving without being deterred by the presence of the young prince whose too open admiration might perhaps have awakened the suspicions of the grand duke on the contrary in the absence of his son he did not unfortunately reflect that he was admitting into the closest intimacy a young girl of surpassing beauty and of lively wit as rodolph must discover at every moment of the day sarah was perfectly insensible to a reception so kind and generous to the full confidence with which she was introduced into the very heart of this sovereign family neither brother nor sister paused for a moment in their bad designs they determined upon a principle to bring trouble and annoyance into this peaceable and happy court they calmly calculated the probable results of the cruel divisions they should establish between a father and son up to that period so tenderly united a few words concerning rodolph's early days may be necessary during his infancy he had been extremely delicate his father reasoned thereon in this strange manner english country gentlemen are generally remarkable for their robust health this advantage results generally from their bodily training which is simple rural and develops their full vigour rodolph must leave the hands of women his temperament is delicate and perhaps by accustoming this child to live like the son of an english farmer with some few exceptions i shall strengthen his constitution the grand duke sent to england for a man worthy of the trust and capable of directing such a course of bodily culture and sir walter murphy an athletic specimen of a yorkshire country gentleman was entrusted with this important charge the direction which he gave to the mind and body of the young prince were such as entirely coincided with the views and wishes of the grand duke 
Murphy and his pupil lived for many years in a beautiful farmhouse situated in the midst of woods and fields, some leagues from the capital of Gerolstein, and in a most picturesque and salubrious spot. Rodolph, free from all etiquette, and employed with Murphy in an outdoor labor proportionate to his age, lived the sober, manly, and regular life of the country, having for his pleasure and amusement the violent exercises of wrestling, pugilism, riding on horseback, and hunting. In the midst of the pure air of the meadows, woods, and mountains, he underwent an entire change, and grew up as vigorous as a young oak. His pale cheek became suffused with the ruddy glow of health. Always lithe and active, he underwent now the most severe fatigues, his address, energy, and courage supplying what was deficient in his muscular power, so that, when only in his fifteenth or sixteenth year, he was always the conqueror in his contests with young men his superiors in age. His scientific education necessarily suffered from the preference given to his physical training, and Rodolph's knowledge was very limited. But the Grand Duke very wisely reflected that, to have a well-informed mind, it must be supported by a strong physical frame, and that, this acquired, the intellectual faculties would develop themselves the more rapidly. The kind Walter Murphy was by no means a sage, and could only convey to Rodolph some primary instruction but no one knew better than he how to inspire his pupil with the feeling of what is just, loyal, and generous, and a horror of everything that was mean, low, and contemptible. These repugnances, these powerful and wholesome admonitions, took deep and lasting root in the very soul of Rodolphe. And although, in after life, these principles were violently shaken by the storm of passions, yet they were never eradicated from his heart. The leaven bolt strikes, splits, and rends the deeply planted tree, but the sap still maintains its hold in the roots, and a thousand green branches spring fresh from what was taken for a withered and dead tree. Murphy then gave to Rodolph, if we may use the expression, health to body and mind. He made him robust, active, and daring, with a love for all that was good and right, and a hatred for whatsoever was wicked and bad. Having fulfilled his task to admiration, the squire, called to England on very important business, left Germany for some time, to the great regret of Rodolphe, who loved him extremely. His son's health having been so satisfactorily established, the Grand Duke turned his most serious attention to the mental education of his dearly beloved son. A certain Dr. César Polidori, a renowned linguist, a distinguished chemist, learned historian, and deeply versed in the study of all the exact and physical sciences, was entrusted with the charge of cultivating and improving the rich but virgin soil so carefully and well prepared by Murphy. This time the Grand Duke's choice was a most unfortunate one, or rather, his religious feelings were infamously imposed upon by the person who introduced the doctor to him, and caused him to think on Polidori as the preceptor of the young prince. Atheist, cheat, and hypocrite, full of stratagem and trick, concealing the most dangerous immorality, the most hardened scepticism, under an austere exterior, profoundly versed in the knowledge of human nature, or, rather, only having tried the worst side, the disgraceful passions of humanity. Dr. Polidori was the most hateful mentor that could have been entrusted with the education of a young man. Rodolphe left with the deepest regrets the independent and animating life which he had hitherto led with Murphy to go and become pale with the study of books, and submit himself to the irksome ceremonies of his father's court, and he at once entertained a strong prejudice against his tutor. It could not be otherwise. On quitting his young friend, the poor squire had compared him, and with justice, to a young wild colt, full of grace and fire, carried off from his native prairies where he had dwelt, free as air and joyous as a bird, to be bridled and spurred that he might under that system learn how to moderate and economize those powers which, hitherto, he had only employed in running and leaping in any way he pleased. Rodolphe began by telling Polidori that he had no taste for study, but that he greatly preferred the free exercise of his arms and legs, to breathe the pure air of the fields, to traverse the woods and the mountains, and that a good horse and a good gun were preferable to all the books in the universe. The doctor was prepared for this antipathy, and was secretly delighted at it, for in another way the hopes of this man were as ambitious as those of Sarah. Although the Grand Duchy of Gerolstein was only a secondary state, 
polidori indulged the idea of being one day its richelieu and of making rodolph play the part of the do-nothing prince but desirous above all things of currying favour with his pupil and of making him forget murphy by his own concession and compliance he concealed from the grand duke the young prince's repugnance for study and boasted of his application to and rapid progress in his studies whilst some examinations arranged between himself and rodolph which had the air of being impromptu questions confirmed the grand duke in his blind and implicit confidence by degrees the dislike which rodolph at first entertained for the doctor changed on the young prince's part into a cool familiarity very unlike the real attachment he had for murphy by degrees he found himself leagued with polidori although from very innocent causes by the same ties that unite two guilty persons sooner or later rodolph was sure to despise a man of the age and character of the doctor who so unworthily lied to excuse the idleness of his pupil this polidori knew but he also knew that if we do not at once sever our connections with corrupt minds in disgust by degrees and in spite of our better reason we become familiar with and too frequently admire them until insensibly we hear without shame or reproach those things mocked at and vituperated which we formerly loved and revered besides the doctor was too cunning all at once to shock certain noble sentiments and convictions which rodolph had derived from the admirable lessons of murphy after having vented much raillery on the coarseness of the early occupations of his young pupil the doctor laying aside his thin mask of austerity had greatly aroused the curiosity and heated the fancy of the young prince by the exaggerated descriptions strongly drawn and deeply coloured of the pleasures and gallantries which had illustrated the reigns of louis the fourteenth the regent and especially louis the fifteenth the hero of cesar polidori he assured the misled boy who listened to him with a fatal earnestness that pleasures however excessive far from demoralizing a highly accomplished prince often made him merciful and generous inasmuch as fine minds are never more predisposed to benevolence and clemency than when acted upon by their own enjoyments louis the fifteenth the bien-aimé the well-beloved was an unanswerable proof of this and then added the doctor how entirely have the greatest men of all ages and all countries abandoned themselves to the most refined epicureanism from alcibiades to maurice of saxony from anthony to the great conde from caesar to vendome such conversations must make deep and dangerous impressions on a young ardent and virgin mind and such theories could not be without their results in the midst of this well-regulated and virtuous court accustomed after the example of its ruler to honest pleasures and harmless amusements rodolph instructed by polidori dreamt of the dissipated knights of versailles the orgies of choisy the attractive voluptuousness of the parc aux cerfs and also from time to time of some romantic amours contrasting with these neither had the doctor failed to prove to rodolph that a prince of the germanic confederation should not have any military pretension beyond sending his contingent to the diet the feeling of the time was not warlike according to the doctor to pass his time delightfully and idly amongst women and the refinements of luxury to repose from time to time from the animation of sensual pleasures amidst the delightful attractions of the fine arts to hunt occasionally not as a nimrod but as an intelligent epicurean and enjoy the transitory fatigues which make idleness and repose taste but the sweeter this was the only life which a prince should think of enjoying who and this was his height of happiness could find a prime minister capable of devoting himself boldly to the distressing and overwhelming burden of state affairs rodolph in abandoning himself to ideas which were free from criminality because they did not spring from the circle of fatal probabilities resolved that when providence should call to himself the grand duke his father he would devote himself to the life which cesar polidori had painted to him under such brilliant and attractive colours and to have as his prime minister one whose knowledge and understanding he admired and whose blind complacence he fully appreciated it is useless to say that the young prince kept the most perfect silence upon the subject of these pernicious hopes which had been excited within him knowing that the heroes of the grand duke's admiration were gustavus adolphus charles the twelfth and the great frederick maximilian rodolph had the honour of belonging to the royal house of brandenburg rodolph thought reasonably enough 
that the prince, his father, who professed so profound an admiration for these king captains, always booted and spurred, continually mounted on their chargers and engaged in making war, would consider his son out of his senses if he believed him capable of wishing to displace the Tudescan gravity of his court by the introduction of the light and licentious manners of the regency. A year, eighteen months, passed away. At the end of this time, Murphy returned from England, and wept for joy on again embracing his young pupil. After a few days, although unable to discover the reason of a change which so deeply afflicted him, the worthy squire found Rodolph chilled and constrained in his demeanour towards him, and almost rude when he recalled to him his sequestered and rural life. Assured of the natural kind heart of the young prince, and warned by a secret presentiment, Murphy thought him for a time perverted by the pernicious influence of Dr. Polidori, whom he instinctively abhorred and resolved to watch very narrowly. The doctor, for his part, was very much annoyed by Murphy's return, for he feared his frankness, good sense, and keen penetration. He instantly resolved, therefore, cost what it might, to ruin the worthy Englishman in Rodolph's estimation. It was at this crisis that Satan and Sarah were presented and received at the court of Gerolstein with such extreme distinction. We have said that Rodolph, accompanied by Murphy, had been absent from the court on a journey for some weeks. During this absence the doctor was by no means idle. It is said that intriguers discover and recognize each other by certain mysterious signs, which allow of them observing each other until their interests decide them to form a close alliance or declare unremitting hostility. Some days after the establishment of Sarah and her brother at the court of the Grand Duke, Polidori became a close ally of Satan's. The doctor confessed to himself, with delectable cynicism, that he felt a natural affinity for rogues and villains, and so he said that without pretending to discover the end which Sarah and her brother desired to achieve, he was attracted towards them by a sympathy so strong as to lead him to imagine that they plotted some devilish purpose. Some questions of Satan's as to the disposition and early life of Rodolph, questions which would have passed without notice with a person less awake to all that occurred than the doctor, in a moment enlightened him as to the ulterior aims of the brother and sister. All he doubted was that the aspirations of the Scotch lady were at the same time honourable as well as ambitious. The arrival of this lovely young woman appeared to Polidori a godsend. Rodolph's mind was already inflamed with amorous imaginings. Sarah might become or be made the delicious reality which would substantiate so many glorious dreams. It was not to be doubted but that she would secure an immense influence over a heart submitted to the witching spell of a first love. The doctor instantly laid his plan to direct and secure this influence and to make it serve also as the means of destroying Murphy's power and reputation. Like a skilful intriguer, he soon informed the aspiring pair that they must come to an understanding with him, as he alone was responsible to the Grand Duke for the private life of the young prince. Sarah and her brother understood him in a moment, although they had not told the doctor a syllable of their secret designs. On the return of Rodolphe and Murphy, all three, combined by one common intent, tacitly leagued against the squire, their most redoubtable enemy. What was to happen did happen. Rodolphe saw Sarah daily after his return and became desperately enamoured. She soon told him that she shared his love, although she foresaw that this love would create great trouble. He could never be happy. The distance that separated them was too wide. She then recommended to Rodolphe the most profound discretion for fear of arousing the Grand Duke's suspicions, as he would be inexorable and deprive them of their only happiness, that of seeing each other every day. The young prince promised to be cautious and conceal his love. The Scotch maiden was too ambitious, too self-possessed to compromise and betray herself in the eyes of the court, and Rodolphe, perceiving the necessity of dissimulation, imitated Sarah's prudence. The lover's secret was carefully preserved for some time, nor was it until the brother and sister saw the unbridled passion of their dupe reach its utmost excess, and that his infatuation, which he could hardly restrain, threatened to burst forth afresh and destroy all, that they resolved on their final coup. The doctor's character authorizing the confidence, besides the morality which invested it, Satan opened to him on the necessity of a marriage between Rodolphe and Sarah. Otherwise, he added, with perfect sincerity, 
he and his sister would instantly leave Gerolstein. Sarah participated in the prince's affection, but, preferring death to dishonor, she could only be the wife of his highness. This exalted flight of ambition stupefied the doctor, who had never imagined that Sarah's imagination soared so high. A marriage surrounded by numberless difficulties and dangers appeared impossible to Polidori, and he frankly told Satan the reasons why the Grand Duke would never submit to such a union. Satan agreed in the importance of the reasons, but proposed as a mezzo termini, which should meet all objections, a marriage which, although secret, should be legal, and only avowed after the decease of the Grand Duke. Sarah was of a noble and ancient house, and such a union was not without precedent. Satan gave the prince eight days to decide. His sister could no longer endure the cruel anguish of uncertainty, and if she must renounce Rodolphe's love, she must act up to her painful resolve as promptly as might be. Certain that he could not mistake Sarah's views, the doctor was sorely perplexed. He had three ways before him. To inform the Grand Duke of the matrimonial project, to open Rodolphe's eyes as to the manoeuvres of Tom and Sarah, to lend himself to the marriage. But to inform the Grand Duke would be to alienate from him for ever the heir presumptive to the throne. To enlighten Rodolphe on the interested views of Sarah was to expose himself to the reception which a lover is sure to give when she whom he loves is depreciated in his eyes. And then, what a blow for the vanity or the heart of the young prince, to let him know that it was for his royal rank alone that the lady was desirous to wed him. On the other hand, by lending himself to this match, Polidori bound Rodolphe and Sarah to him by a tie of the strongest gratitude, or at least by the complicity of a dangerous act. No doubt all might be discovered and the doctor exposed to the anger of the Grand Duke, but then the marriage would have been concluded, the union legal. The storm would blow over, and the future sovereign of Gerolstein would become the more bound to Polidori, in proportion as the doctor had undergone greater dangers in his service. After much consideration, therefore, he resolved on serving Sarah, but with a certain qualification, which we will presently refer to. Rodolphe's passion had reached a height almost of frenzy. Violently excited by constraint, and the skilful management of Sarah, who pretended to feel still more than he did the insurmountable obstacles which honor and duty placed between them and their liberty, in a few days more the young prince would have betrayed himself. Thus, when the doctor proposed that he must never see his enchantress again, or possess her by a secret marriage, Rodolphe threw himself on Polidori's neck, called him his saviour, his friend, his father. He only wished that the temple and the priest were at hand that he might marry her that instant. The doctor resolved, for reasons of his own, to undertake the management of all. He found a priest, witnesses, and the union, all the formalities of which were carefully scrutinized and verified by Satan, was secretly celebrated during a temporary absence of the Grand Duke at a conference of the German Diet. The prophecy of the Scotch soothsayer was fulfilled. Sarah wedded the heir to a throne. Without quenching the fire of his love, possession rendered Rodolphe more circumspect, and cooled down that violence which might have compromised the secret of his passion for Sarah. But, directed by Satan and the doctor, the young couple managed so well, and observed so much circumspection towards each other, that they eluded all detection. An event, impatiently desired by Sarah, soon turned this calm into a tempest. She was about to become a mother. It was then that this woman evinced all those exactions which were so new to and so much astonished Rodolphe. She protested, with hypocritical tears streaming from her eyes, that she could no longer support the constraint in which she lived, a constraint rendered the more insupportable by her pregnancy. In this extremity she boldly proposed to the young prince to tell all to his father, who was, as well as the dowager grand duchess, fonder than ever of her. No doubt, she added, he will be very angry, greatly enraged at first, but he loves his son so tenderly, so blindly, and had for her, Sarah, so strong an affection, that his paternal anger would gradually subside, and she would at last take in the court of Gerolstein the rank which was due to her, she might say in a double sense, because she was about to give birth to a child, which would be the heir presumptive to the Grand Duke. These pretensions alarmed Rodolphe. He knew the deep attachment which his father had for him, but he also well knew the inflexibility of his principles with regard to all the duties of a prince. 
To all these objections Sarah replied, unmoved. I am your wife in the presence of God and men. In a short time I shall no longer be able to conceal my situation, and I ought not to blush at that of which I am, on the contrary, so proud, and would desire openly to acknowledge. The expectation of posterity had redoubled Rodolph's tenderness for Sarah, and placed between the desire to accede to her wishes and the dread of his father's wrath, he experienced the bitterest anguish. Satan sided with his sister. The marriage is indissoluble, said he to his royal brother-in-law. The Grand Duke may exile you from his court, you and your wife, nothing more. But he loves you too much to have recourse to such an extremity. He will endure what he cannot prevent. These reasons, strong enough in themselves, did not soothe Rodolph's anxieties. At this juncture, Satan was charged by the Grand Duke with an errand to visit several breeding studs in Austria. This mission, which he could not refuse, would only detain him a fortnight. He set out with much regret, and in a very important moment for his sister. She was chagrined, yet satisfied, at the departure of her brother. For she would lose his advice, but then he would be safe from the Grand Duke's anger if all were discovered. Sarah promised to keep Satan fully informed day by day of the progress of events so important to both of them and that they might correspond more surely and secretly they agreed upon a cipher of which polidori also held the key this precaution alone proves that sarah had other matters to tell her brother of besides her love for rodolph in truth this selfish cold ambitious woman had not felt the ice of her heart melt even by the beams of the passionate love which had been breathed to her her maternity was only with her a means of acting more effectually on rodolph and had no softening effect on her iron soul. The youth, headlong love, and inexperience of the prince, who was hardly more than a child, and so perfidiously ensnared into an inextricable position, hardly excited an interest in the mind of this selfish creature. And, in her confidential communications with him, she complained, with disdain and bitterness, of the weakness of this young man, who trembled before the most paternal of German princes, who lived, however, very long. In a word, this correspondence between the brother and sister clearly developed their unbounded selfishness, their ambitious calculations, their impatience, which almost amounted to homicide, and laid bare the springs of that dark conspiracy crowned by the marriage of Rodolphe. One of Sarah's letters to her brother was abstracted by Polidori, the channel of their mutual communications, for what purpose we shall see hereafter. A few days after Satan's departure, Sarah was at the evening court of the Dowager Grand Duchess. Many of the ladies present looked at her with an astonished air, and whispered to their neighbors. The Grand Duchess Judith, in spite of her ninety years, had a quick ear and a sharp eye, and this little whispering did not escape her. She made a sign to one of the ladies-in-waiting to come to her, and from her she learned that everybody was remarking that the figure of Miss Sarah Satan of Halsbury was less slender, less delicate in its proportions than usual. The old princess adored her young protégé, and would have answered to God himself for Sarah's virtue. Indignant at the malevolence of those remarks, she shrugged her shoulders and said aloud from the end of the saloon in which she was sitting, "'My dear Sarah, come here.' Sarah rose. It was requisite to cross the circle to reach the place where the princess was seated, who was anxious most kindly to destroy the rumour that was circulated and, by the simple fact of thus crossing the room, confound her calumniators, and prove, triumphantly, that the fair proportions of her protégé had lost not one jot of their symmetry and delicacy. Alas! the most perfidious enemy could not have devised a better plan than that suggested by the worthy princess in her desire to defend her protégé. Sarah came towards her, and it required all the deep respect due to the Grand Duchess to repress the murmur of surprise and indignation when the young lady crossed the room. The nearest sighted person saw what Sarah would no longer conceal, for her pregnancy might have been hidden longer had she but have chosen. But the ambitious woman had sought this display in order to compel Rodolphe to declare his marriage. The Grand Duchess, who, however, would not be convinced in spite of her eyesight, said in a low voice to Sarah, my dear child, how very ill you have dressed yourself to-day. You, whose shape may be spanned by ten fingers, I hardly know you again. We will relate hereafter the results of this discovery, 
which led to great and terrible events. At this moment, we will content ourselves with stating what the reader has no doubt already guessed, that Fleur de Marie was the fruit of the secret marriage of Rodolphe and Sarah, and that they both believed their daughter dead. It has not been forgotten that Rodolphe, after having visited the house in the Rue du Temple, had returned home, and intended in the evening, to be present at a ball given by the blank ambassadress. It was to this fate that we shall follow His Royal Highness, the reigning Grand Duke of Gerolstein, Gustavus Rodolph, travelling in France under the name of the Count de Duren. End of chapter 25「Chapter twenty six of the Mysteries of Paris, Volume One by Eugene Su. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter twenty six The Ball. As the eleventh hour of the night sounded from the different clocks in Paris, the gates of an hotel in the Rue Plumet were thrown open by a Swiss in rich livery, and forthwith issued a magnificent dark blue Berlin carriage, drawn by two superb long tailed grey horses. On the seat, which was covered by a rich hammer-cloth, trimmed with a mossy silk fringe, sat a portly-looking coachman, whose head was ornamented by a three-cornered hat, while his rotund figure looked still more imposing in his dress livery coat of blue cloth, trimmed up the seams with silver lace, and thickly braided with the same material, the whole finished by a splendid sable collar and cuffs. Behind the carriage stood a tall, powdered lackey, dressed in a livery of blue turned up with yellow and silver and by his side was a chasseur, whose fierce-looking moustaches, gaily embroidered dress and hat, half concealed by a waving plume of blue and yellow feathers, completed a most imposing coup d'oeil. The bright lights of the lamps revealed the costly satin lining of the interior of the vehicle we are describing, in which were seated Rodolphe, having on his right hand the Baron de Groen, and opposite to him the faithful Murphy. Out of deference for the sovereign represented by the ambassador to whose ball he was then proceeding, Rodolphe bore no other mark of distinction than the diamond order of blank. Round the neck of Sir Walter Murphy, and suspended by a broad orange riband, hung the enamelled cross of the Grand Commander of the Golden Eagle of Gerolstein, and a similar insignia decorated the Baron de Groen, amidst an infinite number of the crosses and badges of honour belonging to all countries, depending by a gold chain placed in the two full buttonholes of the diplomatist's coat. "'I am delighted,' said Rodolphe, "'with the very favourable accounts I have received from Madame Georges respecting my poor little protégé at the farm of Bouqueval. David's care and attention have worked wonders. "'A propos of la goualeuse, what do you think, Sir Walter Murphy?' any of your cité acquaintances would say at seeing you so strangely disguised as at present they would consider you most valiant charcoal man to be they would be somewhat astonished i fancy much in the same degree as the surprise your royal highness would excite among your new acquaintances in the rue du temple were you to proceed thither as now attired to pay a friendly visit to madame pipelet and to inquire after the health of cabrion's victim the poor melancholy alfred my lord has drawn so lively a sketch of alfred attired in his long-skirted green coat and bell-crowned hat said the baron that i can well imagine him seated in magisterial dignity in his dark and smoky lodge let me hope that your royal highness's visit to the rue du temple has fully answered your expectations and that you are in every way satisfied with the researches of my agent perfectly so answered rodolph my success was even beyond my expectations then, after a moment's painful silence, and to drive away the train of thought conjured up by the recollection of the probable guilt of Madame d'Harville, he resumed in a tone more gay, I am almost ashamed to own to so much childishness, but I confess myself amused with the contrast between my treating Madame Pipelet in the morning to a glass of cordial, and then proceeding in the evening to a grand fête, with all the pomp and prestige of one of those privileged beings who, by the grace of God, reign over this lower world some men of small fortune would speak of my revenues as those of a millionaire added rodolph in a sort of parenthesis alluding to the limited extent of his estates and many millionaires my lord might not have the rare the admirable good sense of the man of narrow means ah my dear de Grone, you are really too good much too good you really overwhelm me replied rodolph with an ironical smile 
while the baron glanced at murphy with the consciousness of a man who has just discovered he has been saying a foolish thing really my dear de groen resumed rodolph i know not how to acknowledge the weight of your compliment or how to repay such delicate flattery in its own way my lord let me entreat of you not to take the trouble exclaimed the baron who had for the instant forgotten that rodolph who detested every species of flattery always revenged himself by the most unsparing raillery on those who directly or indirectly addressed it to him nay baron i cannot allow myself to remain in your debt you have praised my understanding i will in return admire your countenance for by my honour as i sit beside you you look like a youth of twenty antinous himself could not boast of finer features or a more captivating expression my lord my lord i cry your mercy behold him murphy and say whether apollo could display more graceful limbs more light and youthful proportions i beseech you my lord to pardon me from the recollection of how long it is since i have permitted myself to utter the slightest compliment to your royal highness observe murphy this band of gold which restrains without concealing the locks of rich black hair flowing over this graceful neck and my lord my lord for pity's sake spare me i repent most sincerely of my involuntary fault said the unfortunate baron with an expression of comic despair on his countenance truly ludicrous it must not be forgotten that the original of this glowing picture was at least fifty years of age his hair grey frizzled and powdered a stiff white cravat round his throat a pale withered countenance and golden spectacles upon the horny bridge of his sharp projecting nose pardon my lord pardon for the baron exclaimed the squire laughing i beseech you not to overwhelm him beneath the weight of your mythological illusions i will be answerable to your royal highness that my unlucky friend here will never again venture to utter a flattery since so truth is translated in the new vocabulary of gerolstein what old murphy too are you going to join in the rebellion against sincerity my lord i am so sorry for the position of my unfortunate vis-a-vis that i beg i may divide his punishment with him charcoal man in ordinary your disinterested friendship does you honour but seriously now my dear de Graun, how have you forgotten that i only allow such fellows as darnheim and his train to flatter for the simple reason that they know not how to speak the truth that a cuckoo note of false praise belongs to birds of such feather as themselves and the species they claim relationship with but for a person of your mind and good taste to descend to its usage oh fie baron fie it is all very well my lord said the baron sturdily but i must be allowed to say with all due apology for my boldness that there is no small portion of pride in your royal highness's aversion to receive even a just compliment well said baron come i like you better now you speak plain truths but tell me how you prove your assertion why just so my lord because you repudiate it upon the same principle that might induce a beautiful woman well aware of her charms to say to one of her most enthusiastic admirers i know perfectly well how handsome i am and therefore your approval is perfectly uncalled for and unnecessary what is the use of reiterating what everybody knows is it usual to proclaim in the open streets that the sun shines when all may see and feel certain of his midday brightness now baron you are shifting your ground and becoming more dangerous as you become more adroit and by way of varying your punishment i will only say that the infernal polidori himself could not have more ingeniously disguised the poisonous draught of flattery when seeking to persuade some poor victim to swallow it my lord i am now effectually silenced then said murphy and this time with an air of real seriousness your royal highness has now no doubt as to its being really polidori you encountered in the rue du temple i have ceased to have the least doubt on the subject since i learned through you that he had been in paris for some time past i had forgotten or rather purposely omitted to mention to your lordship said murphy in a sorrowing tone a name that never failed to awaken painful feelings and knowing as i do how justly odious the remembrance of this man was to your royal highness i studiously abstain from all reference to it the features of rodolph were again overshadowed with gloom and plunged in deep reverie 
he continued to preserve unbroken silence which prevailed until the carriage stopped in the courtyard of the embassy. The windows of the hotel were blazing with a thousand lights which shone brightly through the thick darkness of the night, while a crowd of lackeys in full-dress liveries lined the entrance hall, extending even to the salons of reception, where the grooms of the chamber waited to announce the different arrivals. Monsieur le Comte Blanc, the ambassador with his lady, had purposely remained in the first reception room until the arrival of Rodolphe, who now entered followed by Murphy and Monsieur de Grun. Rodolphe was then in his thirty-sixth year, in the very prime and perfection of manly health and strength. His regular and handsome features, with the air of dignity pervading his whole appearance, would have rendered him, under any circumstances, a strikingly attractive man. But, combined with the éclat of high birth and exalted rank, he was a person of first-rate importance in every circle in which he presented himself, and whose notice was assiduously sought for. Dressed with the utmost simplicity, Rodolph wore a white waistcoat and cravat, a blue coat buttoned up closely on the right breast of which sparkled a diamond star, displayed to admiration the light yet perfect proportions of his graceful figure, while his well-fitting pantaloons of black kerseymere defined the finely formed leg and handsome foot in its embroidered stocking. From the rareness of the Grand Duke's visits to the Au Monde, his arrival produced a great sensation, and every eye was fixed upon him from the moment that, attended by Murphy and Baron de Grone, he entered the first salon at the embassy. An attaché, deputed to watch for his arrival, hastened immediately to appraise the ambassadress of the appearance of her illustrious guest. Her Excellency instantly hurried, with her noble husband, to welcome their visitor, exclaiming, "'Your Royal Highness is indeed kind thus to honour our poor entertainment.' "'Nay, madame,' replied Rodolph, gracefully bowing on the hand extended to him. "'Your ladyship is well aware of the sincere pleasure it affords to pay my compliments to yourself. And as for Monsieur le Comte, he and I are two old friends, who are always delighted to meet. Are we not, my lord?' "'Your Royal Highness, in deigning to continue to me so flattering a place in your recollection, makes it still more impossible for me ever to forget your many acts of condescending kindness.' I assure you, Monsieur le Comte, that in my memory the past never dies, or at least the pleasant part of it, for I make it a strict rule never to preserve any reminiscences of my friends but such as are agreeable and gratifying. Your Royal Highness has found the secret of being happy in your thoughts and rendering others so at the same time, rejoined the ambassador, smiling with gratified pride and pleasure at a conference so cordially carried on before a gathering crowd of admiring auditors. Thus, then, madame, replied Rodolph, will your flattering reception of to-night live long in my memory, and I shall promise myself the happiness of recalling this evening's fete, with its tasteful arrangements and crowd of attending beauties. Ah, madame la comtesse, who like you can effect such a union of taste and elegance as now sparkles around us? Your royal highness is too indulgent. But I have a very important question to ask you. Why is it that lovely as are your fair guests, their charms are never seen to such perfection as when assembled beneath your hospitable roof? Your Royal Highness is pleased to view our fair visitants through the same flattering medium with which you are graciously pleased to behold our poor endeavours for your and their amusement, answered the ambassador with a deferential bow. Your pardon, Count, replied Rodolph, if I differ with you in opinion— According to my judgment, the cause proceeds wholly from our amiable hostess, Madame l'Ambassadrice. May I request of your Royal Highness to solve this enigma? inquired the Countess, smiling. That is easily given, Madame, and it may be found in the perfect urbanity and exquisite grace with which you receive your lovely guests, and whisper to each a few charming and encouraging words, which, if the least bit exceeding strict truth, said Rodolphe, smiling with good-tempered satire, renders those who are even praised above their merits more radiant in beauty from your kind commendations, while those whose charms admit of no exaggeration are no less radiant with the happiness of finding themselves so justly appreciated by you. Thus each countenance, thanks to the gentle arts you practice, is made to exhibit the most smiling delight, for perfect content will set off even homely features. And thus I account for why it is that woman, all lovely as she is, never look so much so as when seen beneath your roof come monsieur l'ambassadeur own that i have made out a good case and that you entirely concur with me in opinion 
your royal highness has afforded me too many previous reasons to admire and adopt your opinions for me to hesitate in the present instance and for me my lord said the countess at the risk of being included among those fair ladies who get a little more praise or flattery which was it your highness styled it than they deserve i accept your very flattering explanation with as much qualified pleasure as if it were really founded on truth in order more effectually to convince you madame that nothing is more correct than all i have asserted let us make a few observations touching the fine effect of praise in animating and lighting up the countenance ah my lord you are laying a very mischievous snare for me said the countess smiling well then i will abandon the idea but upon one condition that you honour me by taking my arm i have been told wonderful things of a winter garden a work from fairyland may i put up my humble petition to be allowed to see this new wonder of a hundred and one nights oh my lord with the utmost pleasure but i see that your highness has received a most exaggerated account perhaps you will accompany me and judge for yourself only in this instance i would fain hope that your habitual indulgence may induce you to feel as little disappointment as possible at finding how imperfectly the reality equals your expectations the ambassadress then took the offered arm of rodolph and proceeded with him to the other salons while the count remained conversing with the baron de groen and murphy whom he had been acquainted with for some time and a more beautiful scene of enchantment never charmed the eye than that presented by the aspect of the winter garden to which rodolph had conducted his noble hostess let the reader imagine an enclosure of about forty feet in length and thirty in width leading out of a long and splendid gallery surmounted by a glazed and vaulted roof the building being securely covered in for about fifty feet round the parallelogram it described the walls were concealed by an infinite number of mirrors over which was placed a small and delicate trellis of fine green rushes which thanks to the strong light reflected on the highly polished glass resembled an arbour and were almost entirely hidden by a thick row of orange trees as large as those of the tuileries mixed with camellias of equal size while the golden fruit and verdant foliage of the one contrasted beautifully with the rich clusters of waxen flowers of all colours with which the other was loaded the remainder of the garden was thus devised five or six enormous clumps of trees and indian or other tropical shrubs planted in immense cases filled with peat earth were surrounded by alleys paved with a mosaic shell-work and sufficiently wide for two or three persons to walk abreast it is impossible to describe the wondrous effect produced by this rich display of tropical vegetation in the midst of a european winter and almost in the very centre of a ballroom here might be seen gigantic bananas stretching their tall arms to the glass roof which covered them and blending the vivid green of their palms with the lanceolated leaves of the large magnolias some of which already displayed their matchless and odoriferous flowers with their bell-shaped calluses purple without and silvery white within from which started forth the little gold-threaded stamens at a little distance were grouped the palm and date trees of the levant the red macaw and fig trees from india all blooming in full health and vigour and displaying their foliage in all its luxuriance gave to the two ensembles a mass of rich brilliant tropical verdure which glittering among the thousand lights sparkled with the colours of the emerald after the trellising between the orange trees and amid the clumps were trained every variety of rare climbing plants sometimes hanging their long wreaths of leaves and flowers in graceful festoons then depending like blooming serpents from the tall boughs now trailing at their roots then ambitiously scaling the very walls till they hung their united tresses round the transparent and vaulted roof from which again they floated in mingled masses waving in the pure light breeze loaded with so many odours the winged pomegranate the passion flower with its large purple flowers striated with azure and crowned with its dark violet tuft waved in long spiral wreaths over the heads of the admiring crowd then as though fatigued with the sport threw their colossal garlands of delicate flowers across the hard prickly leaves of the gigantic aloes the bignonia of india with its long cup-shaped flower of dark sulphur colour and slight slender leaves was placed beside the delicate flesh-coloured petals of the stephanotis so justly appreciated for its exquisite perfume the two stems mutually clinging to each other for support 
and mingling their leaves and flowers in one confused mass, disposed them in elegant festoons of green fringe spangled with gold and silver spots around the immense velvet foliage of the Indian fig. Farther on, started forth, and then fell again in a sort of variegated and floral cascade, immense quantities of the stalks of the Asclepias, whose leaves, large, umbilated, and in clusters of from fifteen to twenty star-shaped flowers, grew so thickly, so evenly, that they might have been mistaken for bouquets of pink enamel surrounded with leaves of fine green porcelain. The borders of the cases containing the orange sand camellias were filled with the choicest cape heaths, the tulips of toll, the narcissus of Constantinople, the hyacinths, irides, and the cyclamina of Persia, forming a sort of natural carpet, presenting one harmonious blending of the loveliest tints. Chinese lanterns of transparent silk, some pale blue, others pink, partly concealed amid the foliage, threw a soft and gentle light over this enchanting scene. Nor could a more ingenious idea have been resorted to than in the happy amalgamation of these two colors, by which a charming and almost unearthly light was produced combining the clear cerulean blue of a summer's night with the rose-colored coruscations emitted from sparkling rays of an aurora borealis. The entrance to this immense hothouse was from a long gallery glittering with gold, with mirrors, crystal vases filled with the choicest perfumes, and brilliantly lighted, and also raised a few steps above the fairy palace we have been endeavouring to describe. The dazzling brightness of the approach served as a sort of penumbra, in which were indistinctly traced out the gigantic exotics discernible through a species of arch partly concealed by two crimson velvet curtains, looped back with golden cords so as to give a dim and misty view of the enchanted land that lay beyond. An imaginative mind might easily have persuaded himself he stood near a huge window opening on some beautiful Asiatic landscape during the tranquillity of a summer's twilight. The sounds of the orchestra, weakened by distance, and broken by the joyous hum proceeding from the gallery, died languidly away among the motionless foliage of the huge trees. Insensibly, each fresh visitant to this enchanting spot lowered his voice until his words fell in whispers. For the light genuine air, embalmed with a thousand rich odors, appeared to cast a sort of somnolency over the senses. Every breath seemed to speak of the clustering plants whose balmy sweetness filled the atmosphere. Certainly two lovers, seated in some corner of this Eden, could conceive no greater happiness to be enjoyed on earth than thus dreamily to rest beneath the trees and flowers of this terrestrial paradise. At the end of this winter garden were placed immense divans beneath the canopies of leaves and flowers. The subdued light of the hothouse forming a powerful contrast with the gallery, the distance seemed filled with a species of gold-colored shining fog, in the midst of which glittered and flickered, like a living embroidery, the dazzling and varied robes of the ladies, combined with the prismatic scintillations of the congregated mass of diamonds and precious stones. Rodolph's first sensation upon arriving at this enchanting triumph of art over nature was that of most unfeigned surprise. "'This is indeed a wonderfully beautiful carrying out of a poetical idea,' said he almost involuntarily. Then, turning to the ambassadress, he exclaimed, "'Madame, till now, I had not deemed such wonders practicable. We have not in the scene before us a mere union of unbounded expense with the most exquisite taste.' but you give us poetry in action. Instead of writing as a master poet, or painting as a first-rate artist, you create that which they would scarcely venture to dream of. Your Royal Highness is too indulgent. Nay, but candidly, all must agree that the mind which could so faithfully depict this ravishing scene, with its charm of colours and contrasts, beyond us the loud notes of joy and mirthful revelry, hear the soft silence and sweet, gentle murmurs of distant voices, that lull the spirit into a fancied flight beyond this fitful existence. Surely, surely, without suspicion of flattery, it may be said of the planner and contriver of all this, such a one was born a poet and a painter combined. The praises of your royal highness are so much the more dangerous from the skill and cleverness with which they are uttered, and which makes us listen to them with delight, even in defiance of our sternest resolutions. But allow me to call your royal highness's attention to the very lovely person who is approaching us. I must have you admit 
that the Marquise d'Arville must shine preeminently beautiful any and everywhere. Is she not graceful? And does not the gentle elegance of her whole appearance acquire a fresh charm, from the contrast with the severe yet classic beauty by whom she is accompanied? The individuals thus alluded to were the Countess Sarah MacGregor and the Marquise d'Arville, who were at this moment descending the steps which led from the gallery to the winter garden. Neither was the panegyric bestowed by the ambassadress on Madame d'Arville at all exaggerated. No words can accurately describe the loveliness of her person, and the Marquise d'Arville was then in the first bloom of youthful charms. But her beauty, delicate and fragile as it was, appeared less to belong to the strict regularity of her features than to the irresistible expression of sweetness and universal kindness, which imparted a charm to her countenance impossible to resist or to describe. And this peculiar charm served invariably to distinguish Madame d'Arville from all other fashionable beauties. For goodness of heart and kindliness of disposition are but rarely seen as the prevailing passions revealed in a face as fair, as young, high-born, and ardently worshipped by all, as was the Marquise d'Arville, who shone forth in all her luster as the brightest star in the galaxy of fashion. Too wise, virtuous, and right-minded to listen to the host of flatterers by whom she was surrounded, Madame d'Arville smiled as gratefully on all as though she could have given them credit for speaking the truth, had not her own modest opinion of her just claims to such homage have forbidden her accepting of praise she never could have deserved. Wholly indifferent to flattery, yet sensibly alive to kindness, she perfectly distinguished between sympathy and insincerity. Her acute penetration, correct judgment, and lively wit, unmixed by the slightest ill nature, made her wage an early though good-tempered war with those vain and egotistical beings who crowd and oppress society with the view of monopolizing general attention, and blinded by their own self-love, expect one universal deference and submission. Those kind of persons, said Madame d'Arville one day, laughingly, appear to me as if their whole lives were passed in dancing, le cavalier seul, before an invisible mirror. An unassuming and unpretending person, however reserved and consequently unpopular he might be with others, was sure to find a steady friend and partial observer in Madame d'Arville. This trifling digression is absolutely essential to the right understanding of facts of which we shall speak hereafter. The complexion of Madame d'Arville was of the purest white, tinged with the most delicate carnation. Her long tresses of bright chestnut hair floated over her beautifully formed shoulders, white and polished as marble. It would be an impossible task to describe her large dark grey eyes, fringed with their thick lashes and beaming with angelic sweetness. Her coral lips, with their gentle smile, gave to her eyes the indefinable charm that her affable and winning mode of expressing herself derived from their mild and angelic expression of approving goodness. We will not farther delay the reader by describing the perfection of her figure, nor dwell upon the distinguished air which marked her whole appearance. She wore a white crepe dress, trimmed with the natural flowers of the camellia, intermixed with its own rich green leaves. Here and there a diamond sparkled among the waxy petals, as if a dewdrop fresh from its native skies had fallen there. A garland of the same flowers, equally ornamented with precious stones, was placed with infinite grace upon her fair and open brow. The peculiar style of the Countess Sarah MacGregor's beauty served to set off the fair feminine loveliness of her companion. Though turned thirty-five years of age, Sarah looked much younger. Nothing appears to preserve the body more effectually from all the attacks of sickness or decay than a cold-hearted, egotistical disregard of every one but ourselves. It encrusts the body with a cold, icy covering, which alike resists the inroads of bodily or mental wear and tear. To this cause may be ascribed the wonderful preservation of Countess Sarah's appearance. The lady whose name we last mentioned wore a dress of pale amber-watered silk, beneath a crepe tunic of the same colour. A simple wreath of the dark leaves of the Pyrus Japonicus encircled her head, and harmonised admirably with the bandeau of raven hair it confined. This classically severe mode of headdress gave to the profile of this imperious woman the character and resemblance of an antique statue. Many persons, mistaking their real cast of countenance, imagine some peculiar vocation delineated in their traits. Thus one man, who fancies he possesses a warlike air, assumes the warrior. Another imagines, his eye in a fine frenzy rolling, 
marks him out as a poet. Instantly he turns down his shirt-collar, adopts poetical language, and writes himself a poet. So the self-imagined conspirator wastes days and hours in pondering over mighty deeds he feels called upon to do. The politician, upon the same terms, bores the world and his friends with his perpetual outpourings upon political economy and the man whose saintly turn of countenance persuades its owner into the belief of a corresponding character within forthwith abjures the pomps and vanities of the world and aims at reforming his brethren by his pulpit eloquence now ambition being sarah's ruling passion and her noble and aristocratical features well assisting the delusion she smiled as the word diadem crossed her thoughts and lent a willing ear to the predictions of her highland nurse and firmly believed herself predestined to a sovereign destiny spite of the trifling embonpoint that gave to her figure which though fatter than madame d'harville's was not less slender and nymph-like a voluptuous gracefulness sarah boasted of all the freshness of early youth and few could long sustain the fire of her black and piercing eyes her nose was aquiline her finely formed mouth and rich ruby lips were expressive of the highest determination haughtiness and pride the marquise and sarah had recognized rodolph in the winter garden at the moment they were descending into it from the gallery but the prince feigned not to observe their presence the prince is so absorbed with the ambassadress said madame d'harville to sarah that he pays not the slightest attention to us you are quite mistaken my dear clemence rejoined the countess the prince saw us as quickly and as plainly as we saw him but i frightened him away you see he still bears malice with me i am more than ever at a loss to understand the singular obstinacy with which he persists in shunning you you formerly an old friend countess sarah and myself are sworn enemies replied he to me once in a joking manner i have made a vow never to speak to her and you may judge how sacred must be the vow that hinders me from conversing with so charming a lady and strange and unaccountable as was this reply i had no alternative but to submit to it and yet i can assure you that the cause of this deadly feud half in jest and half in earnest as it is originates in the most simple circumstance were it not that a third party is implicated in it i should have explained the whole to you long ago but what is the matter my dear child you seem as though your thoughts were far from the present scene nothing nothing i assure you replied the marquise faintly but the gallery is so very hot it gave me a violent headache let us sit down here for a minute or two. I hope and believe it will soon be better. You are right. See, here is a nice quiet corner, where you will be in perfect safety from the researches of those who are lamenting your absence, added Sarah, pronouncing the last words with marked emphasis. The two ladies then seated themselves on a divan, almost concealed beneath the clustering shrubs and overhanging plants. I said those who would be lamenting your absence, my dear Clemence come own that i deserve praise for so discreetly forming my speech the marquise blushed slightly cast down her eyes but spoke not how unreasonable you are exclaimed sarah in a tone of friendly reproach can you not trust me my dear child yes child for am i not old enough to be your mother not trust you uttered the marquise sadly alas have i not on the contrary confessed that to you which i should hardly have dared to own to myself well then come rouse yourself now let us have a little talk about him and so you have really sworn to drive him to despair for the love of heaven exclaimed madame d'harville think what you are saying i tell you i know him better than you do my poor child he is a man of cool and decided energy who sets but little value on his life he has had misfortunes enough to make him quite weary of it and it really seems as if you daily found greater pleasure in tormenting him and playing with his feelings is it possible you can really think so indeed in spite of myself i cannot refrain from entertaining that opinion oh if you but knew how oversusceptible some minds are rendered by a continuance of sorrows and afflictions just now i saw two large tears fall from his eyes as he gazed on you are you quite sure of what you say indeed i am quite certain and that too in a ballroom at the risk of becoming an object of general derision if this uncontrollable misery were perceived ah 
let me tell you a person must truly love to bear all this and even to be careless about concealing his sufferings from the world for the love of heaven do not speak thus replied madame d'harville in a voice trembling with emotion alas you have touched me nearly i know too well what it is to struggle with a hidden grief yet wear an outward expression of calmness and resignation alas alas tis the deep pity and commiseration i feel for him has been my ruin added she almost unconsciously nonsense what an over-nice person you are to talk of a little innocent flirtation being ruinous and that too with a man so scrupulously guarded as to abstain from ever appearing in your husband's presence for fear of compromising you you must admit that m charles robert is a man of surprising honour delicacy and real feeling i feel the more inclined to espouse his cause from the recollection that you have never met him elsewhere but at my house and because i can answer for his principles and that his devoted attachment to you can only be equalled by the deep respect he bears you i have never doubted the many noble qualities you have so repeatedly assured me he possesses but you know well that it is his long succession of bitter afflictions which have so warmly interested me in his favour and well does he merit this interest and most fully do his excellent qualities absolve you of all blame in thus bestowing it surely so fine and noble a countenance bespeaks a mind equally superior to all mankind how completely are you reminded while gazing on his tall and finely proportioned figure of the preux chevalier of bygone days sans peur et sans reproche i once saw him dressed in his uniform as commandant of the national guard and handsome as he is i really think he looks surpassingly well and i could not but say to myself that if nobility were the award of inward merit and external beauty m charles robert instead of being so called would take precedence of nearly all our dukes and peers would he not be a fitting representative of any of the most distinguished families in france you know my dear countess how very little importance i attach to mere birth and you yourself have frequently reproached me with being strongly inclined to republicanism said madame d'harville smiling gently for my own part i always thought with you that m charles robert required not the aid of rank or titles to render him worthy of universal admiration then what extreme talent he possesses what a fine voice he has and what delightful morning concerts we three have been able to achieve owing to his all-powerful assistance ah my dear clemence do you remember the first time you ever sang with him what passionate expression did he not throw into the words of that beautiful duet so descriptive of his love and his fear of offending her who was the object of it by revealing it let me entreat of you said madame d'harville after a long silence to speak of something else indeed i dare not listen further what you but just now intimated of his depressed and unhappy appearance has caused me much pain nay my dear friend i meant not to grieve you but merely to point out the probability that a man rendered doubly sensitive by the succession of past misfortunes might feel his courage insufficient to encounter the fresh trial of your rejection of his suit and thus be induced to end his hopeless love and his life together oh no more no more almost shrieked madame d'harville interrupting sarah this fearful idea has glanced across my mind already then after a second silence of some minutes the marquise resumed let us as i said before talk of somebody else of your mortal enemy for instance added she with assumed gaiety of manner come we will take the prince for a fresh theme of conversation i had not seen him previously to this evening for a very long time do you know that i think he looks handsomer than ever though all but king he has lost none of the winning sweetness and affability of his manner and spite of my republicanism i must confess i have seldom if ever known so irresistible a person sarah threw a side glance of deep and scrutinizing hatred upon her unconscious rival but quickly recovering herself she said gaily now my dear clemence you must confess to being a most capricious little lady you have regular alternating paroxysms of admiration and violent dislike for the prince why a few months ago i mean about his first arrival here you were so captivated by him that between ourselves i was half afraid you had lost your heart past all hope of recall thanks to you replied madame d'harville smiling my admiration was very short-lived 
for so well did you act up to your character of the prince's sworn foe in such fearful tales did you tell me of his profligacy and misconduct that you succeeded in inspiring me with an aversion as powerful as had been the infatuation which led you to fear for the safety of my heart which by the way i cannot think would ever have been placed in any danger from those attempts of your enemy to disturb its repose since shortly before you gave me those frightful particulars of the prince's character he had quite ceased to honour me with his visits although on the most intimate and friendly terms with my husband talking of your husband pray is he here to-night inquired sarah no replied madame d'harville in a tone of embarrassment he preferred remaining at home he seems to me to mix less and less in the world he never liked what is called fashionable gaiety the marquise's agitation visibly increased and sarah whose quick eye easily perceived it continued the last time i saw him he looked even paler than usual he has been very much out of health lately my dearest clemence will you permit me to speak to you without reserve oh yes pray do how comes it that the least allusion to your husband always throws you into such a state of extraordinary alarm and uneasiness what an idea is it possible you can mean it seriously asked poor madame d'harville trying to smile indeed i am quite in earnest rejoined her companion whenever you are speaking of him your countenance assumes even in spite of yourself but how shall i make myself understood and sarah with the tone and fixed gaze of one who wished to read the most secret thoughts of the person she addressed slowly and emphatically added a look of mingled aversion and fear the fixed pallid features of madame d'harville at first defied even sarah's practised eye but her keen gaze soon detected a slight convulsive working of the mouth with a tremulous movement of the under-upper lip of her victim. But feeling it unsafe to pursue the subject farther at this moment so as to awaken the Marquise's mistrust of her friendly intentions, by way, therefore, of concealing her real suspicions, she continued, Yes, just that sort of dislike any woman would entertain for a peevish, jealous, ill-tempered. At this explanation of the Countess's meaning, as regarded Madame d'Harville's imagined dislike for her husband, a heavy load seemed taken from her the working of her lip ceased and she replied let me assure you monsieur d'harville is neither peevish nor jealous then as if searching for some means of breaking a conversation so painful to her feelings she suddenly exclaimed ah here comes that tiresome friend of my husband's the duc de lucenay i hope he has not seen us where can he have sprung from i thought he was a thousand miles off it was reported that he had gone somewhere in the east for a year or two and behold at the end of five months here he is back again his unexpected arrival must have sadly annoyed the duchess de lucenay though poor de lucenay is a very inoffensive creature said sarah with an ill-natured smile nor will madame de lucenay be the only one to feel vexation at his thus changing his mind her friend monsieur de saint remy will duly and affectionately sympathize in all her regrets on the subject come come my dear sarah i cannot allow you to scandalize say that this return of m de lucenay is a nuisance to everybody the duke is sufficiently disagreeable for you to generalize the regret his unexpected presence occasions i do not slander i merely repeat it is also said that m de saint remy the model of our young elegante whose splendid doings have filled all paris is all but ruined tis true he has by no means reduced either his establishment or his expenditure however there are several ways of accounting for that in the first place madame de lucenay is immensely rich what a horrible idea still i only repeat what others say there the duke sees us he is coming towards us we must resign ourselves to our fate miserable is it not i know nothing so hard to bear as that man's company he makes himself so very disagreeable and then laughs so disgustingly loud at the silly things he says indeed he is so boisterous that the bare idea of him makes one think of pretending to faint or any other pretext to avoid him talking of fainting pray let me beg of you if you have the least regard for your fan or essence bottle to beware how you allow him to handle either for he has the unfortunate habit of breaking whatever he touches and all with the most facetious self-satisfied air imaginable 
End of chapter 26 End of volume 1 of The Mysteries of Paris by Eugène Sue Recorded by Céline Major.